Josh Cohen, ESPN, 106.3 FM, South Florida. You've taken it worldwide with the app and tons of other things. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. What a beautiful studio. Thank you. Thank you. So what's FM radio like now? Now with all the streaming and, yep. and Apple and everything else, you know, like they call it terrestrial radio. Right. But somehow you've managed to stay relevant. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're playing music radio on FM, good luck to you. The, the good news is is that we're local and that we're live. And there will always be a place for live local personalities that, you know, eat where you eat, drink where you drink, live where you live, know this weekend this event's happening, know the traffic situation, hurricane, whatever it is. Um, since we are live personality radio um, on ESPN, and we're afforded that, ESPN has really moved more toward the E, the entertainment part, than the sports part. Because anybody can get scores or stats on your phone or anywhere. But what you might not have is your friends for the ride home. They might not have the people that they know and the nonsense that they do, whether they look forward to their take or just a little bit of fun. Um, if you're not being creative and proactive in FM radio, again, good luck to you. I don't know any remaining like radio disc jockeys. And I never did that, knock on wood. Thank God I never had to. But if you are local and live, personality-based, the people will be with you, which means the advertisers will be with you, which means, you know, like me, I've been blessed, knock on wood, to do one show, two places for 24 years. So that's a pretty good run. That's a pretty damn good run. Yeah, yeah and a lot of changes in that 24 years. What, Absolutely. What was the bit? You know, everything happened so quick. You remember, we like when I was growing up, there was car phones. Then the car phone went to yeah, a big man. phone that nobody could afford. Yeah. And in twenty years, it went from that to all of this. So when that happens, you know, the companies change. And the, remember, Rob, there was a lot of talk like ESPN changed, and you just basically gave a really good, the best answer we got because there was a, a bunch of talk like. ESPN isn't sports anymore. They're this, right. they're that. They're they're with the agenda, whatever it may be. Yeah. But now it makes sense because anybody can just go on the phone and look up scores. Right. So you have to adjust to the times. And yeah. That's what they do. L listen, anybody can go on any phone. You can go on. We have with us. Everyone has a smartphone, and on that you can get any information you want. What you can't necessarily get is entertainment, personality, live, reactive. Again, we are companion. Um, it's not background, like music that plays. The home team, ESPN West Palm programming is, you know, front ground. It's not background. The idea is it's daily soap opera, daily companionship, daily storytelling um, in a format that is consumed live in real time. Of course, our programming also gets repurposed for podcast on demand. You have to. Everything nowadays is on demand. It's not, oh, here's when it's on. People want what they want, when they want, where they want. But at the bottom line, you know, at the end of the day, there will always be a place for people to be amused, entertained. And people still read books, but more listen on nowadays. They listen to books on Audible and other, other format. So, the art of storytelling will never go away. And people who you like or that you like to disagree with that are engaging, entertaining, amusing you, there'll always be a place for that. Whether it's on terrestrial radio, whether it's in recorded podcast form, um, or in video content as well. What we've realized is that sports fans like other stuff too. Most people like sports, but everybody loves food. And movies and music and all the other stuff. So I've always viewed it as why would you want to just come off as so smart to a small audience when you can just have fun and know a little about a lot to an enormous audience? Because at the end of the day, it's just the advertising business, right? The obligation is get an audience, keep them longer than they plan to, so you can serve your advertising partners. I don't think people realize that. We're not here to inform you. We're not here to educate you. We're not even here to en entertain you. We're here to trick you into staying to hear the ads, right. to do business yeah. with the advertising partners. That's all any of this is. Yeah, that's really what it is. It's how long can you keep the listener on right. and and make the money, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what it is. And everybody loves that drive home. Yeah, you I, got I the love perfect time. Listen, man, I, I did you even have conspiracy. Right. You even have conspiracy. <laughs> you even have conspiracy ones. You know, you go to ESPN. I was looking at it, it's like uh, the conspiracy today. You know, that's so different than the normal sports. It's, you know. 
we we've been blessed. He does. He's got this conspiracy. We we've been blessed to um, look. This show of mine started 1999, um, with real radio, which was at the beginning of the FM hot talk revolution. On that day that we launched, I think September 13th, 1999, I think there were seven stations in America that went hot talk all the same day. WNEW in New York was one. Opie and Anthony okay. were a big part of that lineup. For us here was the Love Doctors, and then me joining as Josh Cohen and the home team. And this was the, I mean, this was really before reality TV. Survivor didn't happen until the summer of 2000. So we were ahead wow. of that. Um, you had uh, the real world on MTV. Wow, that's way yeah. And really, that was it. Yeah. There was no social media. There was no pocket internet. There was people on the radio taking phone calls from crazy people talking about anything and everything. And that's what we did. And you learn then what people find interesting and what they don't. And you find out that there's a lot of different types of people that are into different stuff. But there is common denominator. I don't think it was later in my career till I realized you don't got to be smart. You don't have to be even funny. What you have to do is find ways to just trick a big audience to listen and longer than they plan to. So they will keep the advertisers in business. So the advertise that's like I just said, that's really all that this is. I miss I miss the days before social media when you'd listen to the radio and your voice would be on or whoever it is, and I'm trying to figure out what you look like. Right? Oh, in your head yeah, you always hear yeah, that voice yeah. like, Oh, this person's either, you know, they're hot or like and then when you really see them you're like, Oh, that's totally different than what I imagined. Well now you're on here, we see your your face. Nobody days. ever looks like their voice. Right. Like, yeah. Nobody ever looked like their voice. Right. And you're from New York. I'm from Philly. Yeah. I wanted to know who that WHP do you know WHP sure. up there? And Phil, I, WP, yeah. I still want to know what he looks like. The the, the do the I'm, Eagles? He does the Eagles. We what, had we used to have Mel Reese, six ten, six ten, WIP, WIP, yeah, yeah. WIP. Mel have, Reese, yeah, Mel Reese, voice of the Eagles. I mean, like, you guys remember <laughs> the movie? Remember Wayne's World? Yeah. yeah. And they made a whole bit out of it because they're like Handsome Dan. We're gonna meet Handsome Dan, the famous disc jockey. And then they went in the studio, and it was Harry Shearer, and he was like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and they're like you're <laughs> handsome Dan it made fun of the whole thing of that's theater of the mind I believe that hearing things but not being able to see it right. is more interesting than being able to see it yeah. because that's why the book is always better than the movie people always, always. read the book and they go the book was so much better than the movie well why is that because in your mind you cast it the way you wanted right. you envisioned it the way you created it yourself so whether it's podcast you know we're on camera here this episode is brought to you by Let's Get Checked. Are you the man your father was? Recent studies have shown that men's testosterone levels have dropped substantially since the 1980s at about an average of 1% per year. Think about how old your father was when he was born. For example, if he was 30, your testosterone levels could be 30% lower than his. Low testosterone levels can have all type of health effects on men. It can affect your mood, sex drive, memory, muscle mass loss. You name it. And yes, low testosterone is more common the older you get, but it can affect men at any age. So let's talk about today's sponsor, Let's Get Checked. You can order a testing kit that will be delivered to you in a discreet packaging with next day delivery. Once your sample arrives in the laboratory, confidential results will be available from your secure online account within two to five days. So if you want to test your hormone levels without having to leave your home, visit trylgc.com backslash MSCS media and get 25% off your test using the code MSCS media. The link is in the description at the top. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you're always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up, bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever the opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, aqua conversations, waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Does it work? Don't think you need it? Try it free for a month and see. 
You're going to love it. You could be missing the best sex of your life. They say there's nothing sexier than confidence. And Blue Chew can help give you the confidence where it counts. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code MSCS at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com, promo code MSCS, to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. I prefer audio only so I can lock in and visualize that theater of the mind. Yeah, and but then you can create whatever you want, right? Correct. Right. But, yeah. uh, man, you're talking about an era in which every single fan that I met, and, and we did appearances three times a week, and we had hundreds of people show up for us to autograph a poster, or autograph a picture. It was a different time where radio people were something, where people got excited, and they lined up, they waited, they wanted to meet you, and no one ever said... You look like I thought. Not one uh, person ever said, you're exactly what I thought. They always thought I was going to be big and kind of fat. And people said they thought I'd have a beard or like a ponytail. They didn't envision this guy who's barely 5'8". He stands up straight on his tippy toe, you know, that was 142 pounds. No one had that on their bingo card. Never. I always wanted to know what Rush Limbaugh looked like when I was a kid. Yeah. I thought he's either got to be a fat hog. Yeah. Right. Or he's really in shape. And what'd you find out? And has a li- fat hog. <laughs> I mean, I, sorry. We, I, mean, we, I mean, I like, I mean, he's yeah. all right. I mean, just yeah. saying. We had a I guy mean, we used to listen to called uh, Jumpin' Jeff Walker. And I just remember hearing Jumpin' Jeff Walker. How do I know voice. that name? And know. he's from uh, the, uh, KRZ, which is out of uh, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton. That's how I know. Ninety-eight five to KRZ. Yeah. They had a they had a traffic dude named um, Rusty, Rusty Fender. Fender. Rusty yep. Fender was his name. Yep. Rusty Fender. That's but, a good man. But he but he also but he <laughs> was a disc jockey too though. Correct. <laughs> and he's tall as shit. But he's he went tall. by something else. He was Rusty Fender, the traffic guy. But Tree. he was also a, a, a jock. Yes. Ninety-eight five KRZ, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Yep. I know that station. Yeah. Well, I was on Fox in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre. And what they call? Really? Him? Yeah. Rusty uh, what? Rusty Fender. Rusty Fender. <laughs> yeah, that was his That's name. A good one. He was a, a great name. Guy. Yeah. For a traffic guy, it's a great name. Yeah. And then and then how did you get the the pink? How did you become the pink guy? The pink the suit. pink suit pink suit yeah, guy. Pull up by uh, two and yeah. three. Pink suit guy happened. And we're going to see this on the screen, I guess. I, I always wore a lot of pink. Look, it's Palm Beach, bro. And I'm a colorful guy. I like colors. I like bright pastels and such. So that was Fight Week, International Fight Week, UFC 2021. And that would be the Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor press conference for their third fight. So I'm there. I get there Wednesday night. You got a COVID test, I think. So I'm there Thursday for press conference, Friday for weigh-in, Saturday for fight night. I think I stayed Sunday, too. So I'm packing a suitcase, and I've got blazers for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, there's four four jackets. So I just wore the one on Thursday that I thought I was going to need the least play from because that's going to be Thursday afternoon, and then I'm done with it. I don't have dinner plans. That I know. So Saturday night, you need your good jacket. Right? Friday night, you probably need a good jacket, too, because you're going to get out and do stuff. It's Vegas. So the hot pink was literally chosen because – that was the one that I least wanted for getting out and about Friday night or Saturday night. It was, that's as much thought was into it. It was the, the one I didn't need. I didn't think this was going to happen. <laughs> and then when that happened, look, if I had blue on, they just said the blue suit guy. It still works. Right. It's they, good marketing. I, I didn't yeah. wake up that day saying, I'm going to wear the hot pink and I'm going to go cause a scene and such. And be the pink guy. And, and yeah. be the pink suit guy. What's funny, and we talk about this a lot, is that you know there's three generations of people – in South Florida, because there used to be 12-year-old kids back in the year 2000, whose father made them listen to the show on the way home. And now those 12-year-olds then have 12-year-olds now. So that 12-year-old grew up, and now he's got a kid who's 12, and now that kid listens. So we're on the third. So they know my name, and they know my sisters. You know, They know what I drink. They know my feelings on certain things That's and cool. video games that I play. Mm-hmm. But because of this, you're getting stopped in airports you're getting stopped on the street in new york um in manhattan in madison square going outside of it by people that want pictures and then they say what is your name anyway <laughs> would, you, would you ever ask anyone for a picture whose name you didn't know no. Right, no could you ever be a fan of someone that you didn't know their name or what they did that's no. pretty shocking but you get people that are like big fan dude a huge fan of your stuff they don't know my name 
They don't know my real job. They don't know what anything. It's just that weird viral internet thing that that happens, like the chocolate rain guy. And like a press conference like this, yeah, like like this one. What, what's that? What's that leading up to? So, okay, you know you have to be there at such and such time. So, what's that schedule like? Uh, listen, I don't have an obligation uh, because I'm not doing anything for the UFC. There, I'm not even formally doing anything for ESPN West Palm. Who is who we work for? ESPN West Palm, part of Good Karma Brands. I'm credentialed as media and utilizing aspects of that, but I'm kind of really just going because I'm trying to learn this more and, and get more integrated into, and we're doing a, you know programming, we're doing a podcast, myself and Dean Thomas, co-host alongside Tina on the home team. And um, you know Dean is a former fighter and, and Dean is a coach, but Dean wasn't doing anything in media and I was making him do some media stuff because he was always meant to. And now he literally is the UFC's, we call him king of all media, but he's doing everything that he should be and more. So for me, I'm just there to kind of hang out. I've been to many press conferences. I never asked a question before. A, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It gives you crazy anxiety. B, I'm pretty sure whatever I was going to ask, somebody else either did or was going to. In this occasion here with Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier, nobody was asking anything good and nobody was broaching the fact that they're letting this man, Conor McGregor, be a total dick to the good man, Dustin Poirier, about his wife and kid, about his family, in front of his family. So McGregor's got the whole arena chanting and mocking and taunting the man about his wife and his family in front of the man's family. Mm -hmm. And all he could do, Poirier, is just sit there and kind of, and the crowd's on McGregor's side. So when I decided to ask the question... It was because, in all sincerity, this is a valid question that no one's asking. I don't know why, but also kind of need to take up for this dude because the bullying here is, I mean, I know it's a fight, settle inside the cage, but you shouldn't have to be subjected to your wife's and me DMs, this and that. I mean, it was a bunch of nonsense. I'm not a fan of bullying, and the whole arena was on the side of McGregor, so I just asked that question. Especially when you're bringing in yeah, the man's family. family. Yeah. Like, if you're right. just boiling between the two of you, you're yeah, going to go right. in a cage. Who cares? Right. But when you bring in Kid, people have nothing family. to do with that. Yeah. I mean, come on. And, and they fought twice before. Yeah. You know, McGregor won the first one. The second one was only seven months earlier. It was in January, which Poirier won. I'm not going to go inside, you know, fight X's and O's in history. The bottom line is Conor McGregor is the biggest star in the history of MMA. He's still the biggest star. Mm -hmm. And he has won one fight since 2016. <laughs> And it was in January of 2020, Cowboy Cerrone. Conor McGregor's on another level. There's levels, you know, to fame. There's levels to, like, the Beatles are the greatest, but also they're on another level. McGregor may not be the greatest fighter ever, but he's the biggest star. And he still is. The most sold pay-per-views in UFC history are all his. He's the biggest draw. He's the biggest star no matter what. And he's going to bring a different crowd to the arena. And there's going to be a different a level of attendance for a press conference and a weigh-in because Conor McGregor is there. Energy, everything. Absolutely. But the energy was so, like, I could see the discomfort on Poirier. I could see that he was, like, embarrassed and was like, like, what do I do? Like, I knew he'd win the fight. I think we all, Conor knew he would win the fight, and Poirier did. But for me, it was the fact that, like, why does everyone think it's cool to be so disrespectful about the man's family in front of the man's family, his wife and kid, and then just sit here and, and let it happen. Good for you. The, the mob mentality. So I asked Connor the question that, you know, is inconveniently truthful to him. And I phrased it in a manner that would be a little bit like, whoa, he wasn't prepared for it. But I don't know if you've shown the video, but yeah, well, we're going to put we'll yeah. pop up. So, so Dana White is going to say, anybody else have a question? And then when Dana notices that it's me at the, at the microphone, you'll see the look of, confusion concern he's <laughs> where he knows something like why is this guy asking because he knows that i don't ask questions yeah. at press conference <laughs> before this and he's like what and then yeah here let's play it <laughs> connor right here connor right down here dana's concerned see connor question for I you see him, yeah. you have won exactly one fight <laughs> since barack obama was president you got balls <laughs> Get down and smash you when I was Connor, over I'll get down and smash you when I was here. Get down and rock. Over the last rat. six fights. You little rabbit. Can this man smack him. sent smack you him. to a place where time doesn't exist six months ago. 
We want to know why should anyone expect anything different on Saturday? It's one more, it's Look, one more fight I won than your little sissy ass, <laughs> your little funny part. Why should we expect you brought anything him back, different though. on Saturday? Conor, in all sincerity, why would it be any different on Saturday? He said he's just putting his hammers on, his hard hat. My boots been strapped for the last 10 years. I've been working my ass off. For... Thank you. <laughs> you gave yeah, him life. Yeah, you I brought mean, him back. And McGregor put the mic down. And then he just sat back and he, and he looked at the monitor. He had a great line about one more fight than your sissy ass, yeah. but he knew he was beat when he just put the mic down and, and didn't give us a reason back? why we should believe. And so I got stopped like that whole week. Like I did not imagine that that was going to happen. It was not part of my pl- I don't have a plan. But Tina, who I mentioned, um, co-host on the home team, and who you know from the gym, I guess, a mm-hmm. little bit. Um, she was calling my phone. She was, like, texting me, I guess. I had plans right after the press conference. Well, first of all, everything changed because I take the jacket off because I was getting, like, mobbed and people in Ireland was... So I, I got to get back to the Cosmopolitan. I got a meeting with the dude who owns Contenders Clothing, mm-hmm. and we're going to meet in the High Limit Room, have a cocktail, and talk business. Um, but then Tina was trying to get a hold of me because she was saying that she thought, like, that maybe I got murdered <laughs> by, by the fans. Oh, she was worried what? for my safety, my, mean, my well-being. Uh, she was worried that... that I guess it could have been a possibility, yeah, right? That it could have gone bad. Um, I, uh, I mean, that whole weekend, strangers on the street, strangers um, on the strip. And I'm wearing a T-shirt. You know, people in the... What are they saying they, to you? What are they saying to you? Like, what um, are, You're the guy. You're the man. Yo, you're the, you know, ask who's going to win? Or can I get a picture? Or... You know, I mean, some people, you know, not super happy about it, as right. you might imagine. Some people are like, you know, bleep you. But for the most part, even the bleep you folks were like, can we get a picture? Which is <laughs> so which, weird. Which I'm used to from my real job from, you know, 1999, 2001. They don't ask for pictures like they used to. I mean, obviously all that's changed. But when they don't know your name, to circle back, they don't know your name. They don't know what you do, where you're from. They don't know any of that. They want the picture with that guy. Just kind of, kind of strange. Kind of strange. Yeah. yeah. Play the one with Colby. Okay, I gotta pull that one up. Yeah, it should be the very next one. And then you got one in with Colby, right? We had Colby in. Yeah. He I was cool. surprised how calm. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. I I forgot where I was going here, and my I, my brain kind of, and I forgot. And then Colby just saw the opportunity, and he just said, "Hold on, hold on, hold on." Yeah. And good for him to cut it off at the pass. But I got in trouble for this. Oh, this one. Yeah, because I kept going on with Kobe as opposed to then just, I guess they wanted just to regardless anytime I'd seen Kobe before this he'd always come over and he'd always say hey man how's the show how you doing he knows who I am and he knows my association with Dean and the show and everything else Kobe's a different guy in real life than he is you know in this character right it's, it's WWE he's one of the nicest guys he's I a met. super nice guy yeah. I mean, he's a smart guy I take the shirt off your back type yeah yeah yep. totally different guy what he realized was he needed to do something to, to, to save his gig with the UFC well, I almost and, lost his career and absolutely yeah. I mean his time was up and so he went full-on MAGA USA um you know the bad guy the wrestling heel and it worked great for him and in this spot here you can see that I'm kind of losing track of where I forgot what, I, and now it's worst case scenario because my brain is a little ding from concussions and I do lose train of thought. And I now I'm in front of all these people and I'm like, oh, and he sensed it and he almost bailed me out in a sense. But then as I argue back, then I got in trouble. Colby, great color scheme today, by the way. Colby, we are here at Madison Square Garden the world's most famous arena, where the greatest of all time became the greatest of all time. From Muhammad Ali to GSP, right here. I forgot where I was And going. in two days, you get a chance to step inside that cage, and they will lock the door, and you will attempt to take now buying time. that belt <laughs> violently from that man by any means necessary. I forgot the point. Yeah. Right like My golf. question to you is Yeah, yeah like, oh, fuck. Yeah, what's if the if you were to somehow lose this fight yeah. Will yo, you man, agree? Man. Yo, 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 one sec, one sec. Will you agree right now? Yo, one sec, one sec. You look like a bottle of Pepto Bismol. <laughs> and it makes sense because you got diarrhea at the oh, mouth, son. That's a good line. Get out of my arena. <laughs> it's a, look at Dana. Oh, man, look at yeah. Dana. Get this clown out of the building. If you were to lose this fight, do you agree right now? 
to allow an independent medical team to look at your x-rays from 2019 to determine once and for all whether or not that man broke your face. <laughs> Yo, where'd you get your suit from? J.C. Penney? Do you agree, Penny? yes we or no? I came here on a Do you agree, yes or no? <laughs> it's at the beginning. More than uh, your house, your son. Your suit looks like an airbrush, license plate. Like get this clown out of here, Turtle Beach. <laughs> get this clown out of here, man. Why are you it's like a lot of business. Yeah, it's all the fun. fucking you mouth. The Diarrhea of the mouth. Get Answer the question. If you lose the fight, will you allow the x-rays to be released to prove whether or not your jaw was broken? I want to give a special thank you to Luigi Girardi. He he designed this great suit. <laughs> Luigi Girardi. Shout out. Hey, yeah. Ricardo Suarez, you made the, the artist. Now, poor Wei Lee, she doesn't speak English. I am English. the king of Miami, so. She's like, what's happening? Shout out to Luigi Girardi. She has no idea what's going on, right? world. That's it. Thank you. You have another question? <laughs> so at the beginning, you know, I said, good color scheme. And he said, thank you. Because literally my, my jacket is pink with a blue. And it's like identical to the colors. I mean, it's a plaid, but regardless. And what do you think about uh, Jones not fighting in New York? John Jones? Yeah. Getting hurt? That's a shame. Yeah, yeah that's a that, shame. That was a nice ticket. Yeah, I mean, we talk about stars. You have Connor, and then John Jones isn't far beneath, but there's there's a level beneath to that. Yeah. Um, I give Colby credit because a lot of his stuff has been very scripted and very, and he went off the... And so if you see the video where you can see me in the same shot, you see me smile and point and say, that's good because I was impressed. Yeah, because he had cool. I was, proud of, I was right. proud of the yeah. kid. It was like, yeah, that was like a real reaction. Yeah. Good for you, Cece. Now watching those press conferences from home, like seeing them, you're there, right? I've been at press conferences before. Is How much of it is, like you see them, they go nose to nose, right? They're staring each other down. One may push or do like that. How much of that, in your opinion, is just for the show, just to get everybody riled up? And how much of it do you think sometimes is, this is the real deal? These I mean, two fuckers yeah. hate each other. Yeah, it goes both ways. I mean, there are times in which clearly they're trying to sell a fight. Right. There's times in which they have to create a narrative. And then there's other times in which, no, 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 those guys either don't like each other or they really do respect each other or both. They don't like each other and they do respect each other. And what you're getting is palpable. You can generally tell when it's manufactured heat. You can generally tell when right. someone's trying to sell a fight, like that Dylan Dennis, Logan Paul yeah. boxing nonsense. Or even, you know, this summer I went and covered um, Nate Diaz and, um, excuse me, Nate Diaz and, and Jake Paul. And Jake was really trying to sell it because Nate wasn't interested in selling it. And at the end of the day, all we're doing is selling pay-per-views. That's all. Same with this. Selling pay-per-views. Our company, Good Karma Brands, ESPN West Palm, ESPN New York, LA, Chicago, Madison, Milwaukee, Cleveland, they tasked us um, prior to this with driving subscribers to ESPN Plus. You know, bundle it with Hulu Plus and what's the other app? Uh, Disney Plus for whatever a month or ESPN, ESPN Plus. So I remember we had live reads in studio, you know, ESPN Plus, get it now, this discount, et cetera. All of the UFC is broadcast exclusively on ESPN+. Plus. ESPN, when it does go, some cards on cable, but it's all ESPN+, Plus, regardless of whether you have ESPN. And then if you're doing pay-per-view, it's only through ESPN+, Plus pay-per-view. So I'm actually functioning in a role of ESPN+, Plus subscription, part thereof. I mean, I'm being asked by the boss and the boss's boss to do this on the year in studio. What a better place to do it than right there at Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that one obviously got sideways. That's why I lost my train of thought. Kobe had an opportunity, took it. I don't blame him. He had a great line. Good for Kobe. I was proud of the kid. Yeah, I mean, he had lived, like you said. Yeah. You know, Funny I mean, off the cuff. Yeah, I, I like him. He would fit. You, I mean, you said you worked there before, but you would fit in perfectly in Philadelphia. Can you imagine him going at some of these guys? The, guys, the town would love you. Would just love it. Oh, in, in sports in media? Phil, in Philly. In Philly? Oh, man. Maniac. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I worked in Philly. In, in sports media, um, that town is the fans are very brutal. The best, they're fans. pessimistic. When someone is drafted, they're never hopeful. No, they always think that that's not who they should have got. They should have got so and so. We know everything. It's yeah. worst case scenario. Yeah. It's always worst case scenario. <laughs> right. It's always, you know, if somebody's got a great play, but somebody has a bad play, it's that do with the bad play. Um, the Phillies, man, that stadium was so loud this year. That crowd was great this year, and it felt like it was the Phillies' year, didn't it? Yeah. It felt like it was, and then all of a sudden, 
the big bats went one for 28 in games five, six, and seven. They just vanished in Arizona somehow. Yeah, but anyway. I don't know. That's I, I I can't get into baseball anymore. It's too boring for post-season me. Postseason baseball. When they yeah, start post-season. cracking them, postseason I'll watch. Yeah. yeah. That's all I, I watch. watch. I can't. I, I watch opening day and then postseason. I watch game one and then game 163. But nothing between two and one sixty two. Oh yeah, no. okay. But it's crazy to like watch down. I always say like sports. I mean, we're, I'm from that area too, neck of the woods, right? Big Eagles fan, all that good stuff. But it's like, you go to a game down here. You go to a Dolphins game. You go to a Marlins game. People show up in the third quarter. It's like, where have you been? And yeah. There's no passion behind it when they're winning, of course. It's just it's not that same sports passion in South Florida than it is. In yeah, because Florida. they're not generational. They right. didn't. You know, like my nephew just had a baby. My nephew's 28. I remember when he was born, his bedroom, before he even got brought home from the hospital, was painted teal and orange dolphin with the dolphin wallpaper runner that went across the whole... Because his father, even he's in Bill's country and Giants and Jets country, upstate New York, um, is a dolphin fan. So he had a baby, my nephew did, Thursday, his first child. And that kid immediately was put into a Jalen Waddle jersey, and his room is Dolphins. He didn't have a choice, right? It's generational. But down here, as you say, like maybe we're on the first generation of Marlin fans because right. the Marlin started in what, 1993. So if you were a little kid in 93, maybe you now just had a kid. Yeah. So there isn't that connection. The Dolphins, there is, but like the Heat, that's, you know, C and B seen. Mm hmm. Panthers hockey, they're a little bit of yeah, fans, they're... but it's not like flyer hockey. It's not like Red Wing hockey. It's not like, you know, Pittsburgh Penguin hockey, where there's a fan base at my grandfather's, you know. There's a pride behind it, though. For sure. For sure. I, I had the craziest one. Born in Italy, came here. My grandpa was a diehard Notre Dame fan. Go Irish. From the, the Italians. Day, from the day I was <laughs> born, Lou Holtz. Lou Holtz. Really? Yeah, Notre Dame – Nonstop on Saturdays. And uh, football was the Washington Redskins. Yeah. Like, that was it. But that was my, I mean, yeah. that's. Your grandfather from Italy took to the Fighting Irish. Yep. Catholic, the, Catholic school. Yeah. 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 Heavy, yeah. heavy, heavy, heavy. That's family. crazy. What do you think about Aaron Rodgers? I, you think he'll be back this year? What do you think? I mean, Aaron likes to be the story, but he also likes to beat the odds. He also likes to disprove medicine and science. If he can, he would. But where are they in the standings? If there's a game that's meaningful, where it's like the Jets win this game and they will make the postseason, if he's able to go, he would. If it's a case of the Jets are just playing out the string, he's able to play, I don't think that he would. Um, he likes to prove everybody wrong. In medicine and science, I know more than you do. But I like Aaron. I think Aaron's smart. No, I like him too. And I think Aaron doesn't give a bleep. No. He just does his thing. And you see, like, how that team, if you watched Hard Knocks in training camp, how everyone responded to him and his energy. Yep. And just, like, literally Quentin Williams, who was a first-round pick and got really paid, was, like, giving shout-outs to the camera on the sideline. He's like, shout-out Aaron Rodgers. Thank you for coming here to help us. Like, he's thanking a teammate to help us. Right. Um, if he could play, if he's able, yes, if the game means postseason postseason if the game is if they're no way you, you know that. yeah if there's if there's six and nine and there's you know two games left he's not playing poor zach wilson right that guy <sighs> he's had a, i mean zach wilson had a chance oh. two seasons to be the guy couldn't do it didn't do it last year had a major issue with the media and accountability and then says you know they're talking about bringing a veteran in he says i'll make that guy's life hell and then, meanwhile, here comes Aaron Rodgers, and it's like, you're going to do what? <laughs> when he says, I'm going to make that guy's life hell, he means, like, I'm not going to give him my job. I'm not just going to give it up. And then Rodgers showed up, and he's like, okay, it's your job. <laughs> what, what, what are your thoughts about be, you know, being a member of the media and you're going to press conferences, right, after games, tough times, guys lose, they're pissed, and they don't want to do the interview, or you see where they'll get fined, I'll rather take the fine. What do you think about that when they say, I'm not speaking to anybody, fuck you? I mean, everybody's got a job, right? Everybody's got a job to do. The best relationships are when everybody understands that you got a job to do, I got a job to do. When we both do our jobs, we both eat. Because you say, well, what's, what, why is it important that this guy from this media outlet gets that question in? Well, what did we talk about at the very start of this? And that is advertising. So the dude from Bloody Elbow MMA or 
MMAJunkie.com and all these sites that are at all the events, their existence depends on getting a question, getting an answer, getting a moment of content that people click on, that people consume, because why? Because it's advertising. Everything is just advertising. It's just the advertising business. I'm a media personality. Great. I'm an on-air personality. Radio, some television, some podcast. Great. But at the end of the day, it's the advertising business. And for the dude who's asking the question at the press conference and wants the you know athlete to answer, he needs something that's going to get clicks or eyeballs or, clipped. or engagement. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't sell ads. And if we do sell ads, those advertisers aren't seeing ROI. So then they're out. People forget it's not that complicated. And then you're out real quick if That's you're not it. making that ROI. <laughs> yeah. All of this, all of this is the advertising business. That's all. It. YouTube is the advertising podcast, advertising Everything. business. Social media outlets. You know, right. I hate this term influencers because there's some girl with, with big cans and she's an influencer. No, she has a lot of followers. Influence means I can make you change the way you think. I can make you change the way you spend. Yep. We were the original influencers on FM radio and FM personality hot talk because literally we could say, try this. You got to try these Wickles, pickles, yeah. whatever this is at Publix, and literally sold them out in every store in seven counties. Had that kind of power. We could ch influence your spending, your buying, your thinking, your thought process. You're someone on Instagram with 500,000 followers. That's great. But do you have influence? Influence means you can make people do or not do, change their the girl. You're right. Because I remember listening to mm -hmm. the radio and they would say, there's an auction or there's an event here. And everybody would try to get there in 10 minutes. And it would be packed by the yeah. time you got there. Like the park, first 100 people that get here are free tickets. I mean, listen. Yeah. Would, yeah. The, the original influencer is the guy that you know that you trust his judgment. You know, you said your grandfather from Italy. Maybe he knows a great restaurant in yeah. whatever town you're in. When someone's being paid, hey, folks, it's me for this, you tune it out. Because they're just... The Simpsons goofed on that from day one, Krusty the Clown. <laughs> I hereby endorse the following good product right. or service. Right. He didn't even say the name of the business. Okay, Josh, you've been in media. Yep. How the fuck do they know everything? How does the Simpsons, Simpsons know everything? They knew 9-11. They knew COVID. Trump, the Trump thing. Trump. I mean. How do they know? They got a CIA guy in there that so, left. So, smart writers, <laughs> smart guys. Got um, pretty smart for that. From Ivy League schools. But some of those memes and that got, you know, altered, right? To make it seem. Retrofitted. They changed. <laughs> they rewrote history. But, um, yeah, influence is different from follower count. I don't have a ton of followers. I got some influence. I can, But the most organic Influence, the most organic endorsement. It's just somebody that isn't making any money to tell you you'll like that show. You like that restaurant. You should stay in that hotel. Make sure when you go there, you visit this. If you like and trust that person, you're going to take their word on it. They've earned your influence. Word of mouth will always beat oh. any other form. Yeah. Right. And word of mouth comes legitimately from someone's credibility that you've heard. If you've listened to the show for years and you think they're funny, they're real, they tell the truth, they're honest. You can tell that they keep it real. If I say that there's this show on AMC and it's about this chemistry nerd teacher and now he's cooking meth with a scumbag former student, watch this show. It's called Breaking Bad. You guys will love it. Mm -hmm. No one's paying me to do that. But what they do is they tune in and they go, this show's awesome. Again, I trust his judgment. It's not a thousand percent. There's going to be stuff that you don't like, but that's real influence comes from actual endorsement without a motivation. When a guy says, hey, you know, the best brand of this is this. I mean, we're all consumers, all of us. You tune it out. You know you're being sold. Nobody wants to be sold, but you do want to be hooked up. You don't want to be sold an agenda, but if somebody goes, yo, if you go to Vegas, I'm telling you, go, to, go see my guy, knock on the back door, and you say the password, and I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. and, and on radio... You know, like everybody knows you have a commercial break coming up. Yep. Right. So they let so like if I'm listening, you say, Hey, the hot dogs down here are, are great. Yeah. I'm gonna think in my head, well, you're not gonna waste a minute of your sixteen minutes to talk about hot dogs if they're not good. They're not paying you. You right? Well, you know, like when you're on the radio, if you're not getting paid by the hot dog stand and just in the middle of talking about Aaron Rodgers, you say, you know, 
Tina, there's a great hot dog place right down the street. But, but it's an, but it's a non-endorsement. Right? Non-endorsement. Making, right. That's what I mean. Absolutely. You, you're just taking that one minute from when yeah. you would be talking about normal stuff, right. not paid, and say that to somebody. They're going to take it seriously. Of course. Yeah. yeah. No, you should take it all seriously because, I mean, not everyone does it the same. Some folks just take a check because they. I'm not. Listen, I'm not endorsing anything that I haven't bought with my own money or wouldn't use myself personally. Because all the only credibility you have is that you're going to get the prediction wrong on the World Series. I thought the Phillies were going to win it when it got down the Final Four. You're going to get Super Bowl predictions wrong. There, that's not important. What's important is if you tell someone, if you tell your audience, go there, go see them. They're the one. Spend your money, with, and they have a bad experience. They will never forgive you for it mm-hmm. because you're why they did it. You're the one that sent them. You vouched for it. So now your endorsement's bullshit. It ain't worth it for me to risk my entire living to make a few bucks from one business that may be gone tomorrow. If it isn't what I say it is, then I'm not saying it. It's got to be what I say it is. That's the only credibility you have. Getting games wrong and who's going to win that fight and predictions, everyone's going to get that wrong. What you can't get wrong is when you tell someone, if you need a battery for your vehicle, St. Lucie Battery and Tire, slbt.com. That's a family-owned business. They take pride in that. I endorse a ton of companies, and you'll notice the underlying theme is that they're family-owned local families. Accountability. Someone's accountable for it. If it's a major corporation based in Denmark, no one cares. But if it's a local family, they're going to make it right. They're going to fix it. They're going to do right by you, period. So if I say it on the air about a business, a product, a company... I'm well aware that if one person has a bad experience with them, I've lost that person. Now, no matter what I say, doesn't mean shit to them. Yeah. That's, that's a good pretty, way to put it. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. That's all you got. That's all you got. It's like your word. All you got is your that's word, ex- right? exact. That's exactly what it is. My word is, isn't because they're paying. They are compensating me and the company to share this message with you. But if I didn't think it was true, if I didn't think there was value for you, um, I wouldn't say there was because then you're going to think everything else I say is nonsense and only because you're being paid to say that. And how much more pressure has been put on you, like on radio, now that there is streaming and everything else? Is there more pressure on you with ads to hit certain things, anything like that? No, it's. I mean, look, it, it's better than ever because you can listen on your radio, 106.3 FM. You can listen on your smartphone. You can listen on the ESPN app. You can listen on Alexa, Google. You can tell any connected device, play ESPN West Palm, and it will instantly stream for free. So it just means we're more accessible, more places. We're worldwide. Yeah, we're on the ESPN app. But I've literally been in the south of France to go MC an event and opened up the ESPN app, laying in my hotel bed, and hit ESPN West Palm so I could hear what they were doing on my show without me there. Hmm. And it streams clear immediately like you're in the same room. Um... There's no pressure if you are understanding what it's about. Again, if I was a local disc jockey on an FM radio station, I'd have been worried 15 years ago. I'd have been more worried 10 years ago. I'd be terrified right now. Going back to Rogers quick, with now, like now, Aaron's walking, he's throwing, he's stepping back. Yeah. Back when Kobe tore his Achilles, what do you think the difference is now in the time? I mean, it, time, but there, I mean, what do you think Aaron did? That Kobe didn't. Or I think uh, Lynch for the Seahawks, he tore his Achilles. A couple guys in, in running backs tore their Achilles yeah, co- back in like six months. Yeah, it's a pretty common injury. I mean, is it stem cells? Is it- I, I don't, I mean, Aaron Rodgers is someone that looks at how things have always been done the- and thinks, is there a different way to do it? Is there a better way to do it? No matter what it is, he questions everything. He's contrarian by nature. Aaron Rodgers, if you said that something was gray, he would say it's more of an eggshell. It's more of an <laughs> but he's always looking for an event. The greats always the do. Yeah. The greats, I mean, if you watch the uh, Michael Jordan documentary with yeah. the Bulls' last dance, he's always looking for an edge. If you watch the Tom Brady Man in Arena series. Do you think Tom Brady's the, the GOAT, Uh-oh. the quarterback of all time? We did it. Here we go. We do this left at the end. Is he the greatest to ever play the position? Quarter- quarterback of, yeah. Just he, quarter- he's the winningest, right? So we know that. When you get into semantics about, like, they always say most valuable player versus best player. Because somebody could be the best player in the league, but they weren't the most valuable because what they meant to their team in relation to. We always go with GOAT. It's, yeah, of course. Of I, course. 
But goat is so Let's overused. Let's see what he says. Let's see what he says. All right. Goat is good. The term goat is so overused. Know, probably uh, LeBron, who sits out every game, uh, probably came up with a that. Legi- but... A legit, I mean, who invented goat? Muhammad know. Ali. I'm oh, the greatest shit. of all time. That's right. The greatest of all time. Well, that is I'm Muhammad pretty. Ali. I'm so pretty. <laughs> greatest <laughs> of all time. G O A T. You're right. Muhammad Ali was the, the first rapper. He was the originator of rap. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Everything was rhythmic. It rhymes True. with me. Ali, inve- he invented hip hop. Yeah. Um, goat, so overused on Twitter. A legitimate source, not some idiot, but like Bleacher Report or somebody asked the question, "Who is the goat <laughs> of right now?" And I was like, "Hey, idiots, you do know what." O A T means. <laughs> you can't have a goat of now. It's either the best now or the goat. They were asking who is the goat of right now. And that was a bleachers report. It was, I don't want to or forget it. It, it was a legitimate someone. media source. It was someone like that. And I'm like, who is running this account that doesn't know? I think they just think that goat means like the a, a great. No, it means definitively of all time. Tom Brady. I mean. I saw a lot of great quarterbacks, and I know about a lot of great quarterbacks. Tom Brady, it, I mean, he's won more Super Bowls than any franchise, right? He's won more Super Bowls than any franchise. So, yeah, he's he's the greatest of all time. Uh, what happened, Rob? He thinks Montana. Joe Montana. Joe Montana was special. He was. But in those opportunities, he didn't take them to the places that Brady did. Oh, but I know like, like like that drive, like you'll say, all right, 1989, Miami, it was the Super Bowl against the Bengals. There's a minute, eight, whatever left. They're at the seven-yard line or whatever, and they get in the huddle in Montana. You think we would be terrified. And he says to Harris Barton, he says, isn't that John Candy? Over the, and they're like, dude, like we're a minute away and 93 yards away, and you're worried about movie stars that are in the crowd. Montana's just different. I did an event with Montana. Okay, yeah. And he's just like, he's just a different kind of dude. He's just, Montana's just cool. Like, just chill. It was just, he and I in a, in a, in, a, in like a, a meeting room like this. And we were doing an event together to raise money in DC. And he's just like one of the guys. He's just, he's like, oh, my wife. He's like, I can't take pictures <laughs> with people. He's like, I can't take pictures. He goes, I, in the airport, he goes, because, People then claim that you touched them inappropriately. They yeah, try to yeah. sue you for oh, nothing. He said, but you'll see like Keanu Reeves, if you look in any picture he takes, his hand is clearly visible. Yeah. He does the thing where he's got the, the phantom like arm around so you, so you can't get sued. Montana's awesome. But Montana didn't have the success. that Brady, And you can say, well, he never lost the Super Bowl. But he also didn't go to... So it, 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 How many Brady go to? Nine, nine, ten? Nine, I think, yeah. I don't know, but I just remember the last year he played, fourth quarter, end of the season, been hit more than ever, I would say, between the last two seasons he was with Tampa. Definitely that first season, hit more than ever, and threw a perfect ball, like 70 yards. I don't know if you remember that. They played it 100 times, but, I mean, it was a perfect spiral. Fourth quarter at, what, 42, 43 years old? Brady, Brady's special comes from even when he had the job and was the GOAT, he still worked just like Kobe that you have up there. The greats that I've known, and I've known some of the greats. I've been blessed to know some of the greatest of all time at what they do. The common denominator is they just outwork everyone. The genetics don't matter. The talent is only a part of it. They outwork everybody. They're just willing to suffer more. They're willing to sacrifice more. They're willing to work harder than you mentioned. I know we were off camera about Kobe after a Laker game. Yeah. The arena's empty, everybody's gone, and he's out there, and there's no cameras on, and he's out there shooting whatever uh, shot he missed. A thousand jumpers, ten thousand probably, and because that was that Kobe. Same spot, whatever shot he missed during that game that pissed him off for hours. He wanted yeah. to be the greatest to ever do it. He wore 24 because it was one more than Jordan's 23. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew Kobe, like we said, when he was a high school kid. He was the most cocky, confident 16-year-old and then 17-year-old and then 18-year-old that I ever knew. You remember at the All-Star game he told Jordan he was going to beat him? Yeah. <laughs> He's 18 years old telling Michael Jordan he's going to beat him at half line. When, when, when Kobe was a high school kid, <laughs> the Sixers drafted Jerry Stackhouse, Jerry Stackhouse out of North Carolina. Yeah, and 
they did a workout and Kobe um, they, they worked out with Stackhouse and it was a closed gym. There was no cameras and none of that. And nobody really knew about this. And I guess Kobe schooled Stackhouse so bad that there was internal conversations with the Sixers. Did they take the wrong guy? I mean, they knew Kobe was going to be special, but they had real concerns about, did we screw this up? Like he just embarrassed our guy. He embar- our number one pick who I think <laughs> like third Maybe maybe second. Yeah, I think it was three. Yeah. Out of North Carolina, um, but Tom Brady, with all the things he accomplished, still worked even harder, and spent more time watching film, because athletically Tom Brady was nothing special. All that effort, all that repetition, all of that knowing exactly what to do, what not to do, and then just having the poise. Been there, done that. I mean, think about the first time you drove a car. How terrified you were. If you ever had a car accident, think about the next time that you drove a car after the accident. But then think about how you drive every day. Tom Brady was driving AFC Championship game Super Bowl drives like it was every day. Like it was every Where day. other dudes are like, oh my God, it's the first time I'm in a car after uh, an accident. You know, I've been in three car accidents. And the first time I drove right after the accident, it's like you're terrified. Mm-hmm. And I like that you pointed out. Tom Brady doesn't have much talent. If you no. really watch him, he's not mobile. No. You know, he's... He doesn't have much. He was never a tremendous athlete. He was the hardest worker and who learned the mechanics. Smart. Who learned, of course, who who learned how to be great. Yeah, I mean, I I love Montana and Brady too, but I don't think you can argue with given the opportunity to take a team there. He And I know it's a team sport. It's so much harder to do Mm. than it is, say, in fighting or golf or tennis. You know, it's an individual out there by themselves. It's a lot easier to evaluate. And what try it? Out of all the sports that drive me nuts, it's the NBA. <clears throat> I can't stand it. I can only watch the playoffs anymore because you can't hand check, you can't touch, and now you got guys sitting out like LeBron. All, all these we're, guys. We're I've never seen this shit where they just, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, you know, if if I'm a kid and my dad saves up to take me to see LeBron and he decides to sit out yeah. because his finger hurts or whatever it is, well, we just saved up to come see you. They're Back talking in the day, about that right now. Like Jordan never yeah. did that. Kobe never missed a game. That was the you know when when it started to become an issue. That's the exact example I gave. I said somewhere out there is a single mom whose son or daughter only wanted to see Kobe play or LeBron play, and so for Christmas and birthday combined, that's what they and they go to the game and that players just sitting there for workload management to rest. And you say, and literally the commissioner has cited that. Yeah. I mean, it was the scenario I originally gave when the thing started to be a thing. And now they've got rules about that. But I don't, I don't find, remember it happened when Stern was running things. No, it was, wasn't an issue. But the money was different. Then. Yeah, the thing money, is, is that yeah, right. in, in all sport, in all of sport, no players have the power that the NBA players do. In the NFL, the players don't have the power. Is that right? And it, the NBA's got that much juice, huh? We talk about it on the air all the time. Hmm. Think about football. You don't recognize those guys off the field. The the quarterback, maybe. But everybody else, you don't recognize, because they wear a helmet and a face mask, and you sit far away. Baseball, those dudes wear hats. You sit far away. Hockey, they wear helmets and face masks. You sit far. Basketball, you sit, you sit courtside. Basketball, full face all the time. One player can change the fortune. Think, look at the money in the NBA. Dudes that are making... Four hundred million dollars. James Harden. They've got all the power. James Harden talked his way out of and into four different places. Yeah. Out of into, out of into, out of into. This wasn't as a free agent. Talked his way out of and then into four different times. They've got all the power. So now that players' union, by the way, has mm. more power than any of the other unions as well. These guys say, "I'm not going to play." They say, "When do you have to play?" They say, oh, "Something's not right with my knee." Mm-hmm. I mean, you can always work around it. How can you disprove that? But the commissioner's like, "Uh." Uh-uh. We're not, we're not doing this. We're not having this. So maybe they'll figure out a way when players miss how that could affect some kind of a playoff home court advantage or your opportunity to earn. Like you, There's got to be some kind of incentive to play, to play and, and some kind of, kind of punishment toward the end season goal to not. I don't know how you formulate that, but I'm sure there's a way. You have to. Yeah, you have to. I think you have to. Yeah. What do you think about the college kids, the co- especially football? Do you think that they should be getting paid or money put in a trust fund? For I mean, name, image, likeness? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because like when I was growing up, I don't remember college coaches getting $30 million oh, contracts. Paid, I, I mean, now some of these college guys are making more than the pros. Um, and the colleges are making money galore. But 
No, there, 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 are, there are players in college football this year that are earning more money than players in the NFL. That is true. Caleb Williams, I think, out of yeah. USC, I think, yeah. I think he's at north of two million dollars this year. The, you know, the thing was, it was always a sham. The NCAA wants you to think that college athletics is pure competition, love of the game, love of sport. But if they want to be honest about it, that kid going to that school. That kid got paid under the table. Mm -hmm. His parents, his family, things got hooked up. Cars got bought. This is nothing new. This has gone on since the 70s when there started to be real money in the 80s in this. But that kid, when it was time to go to high school, went to a certain high school because somebody got paid, got paid off also. But that kid, when he was a middle school kid, they needed on a certain AAU. People don't realize that AAU, the youth basketball, was the whole feeder program because the sneaker... There used to be a sneaker war. Yeah. And the sneaker companies, the Adidas guy was like, that kid's 11 years old, but we know he's going to be. We got to get him on our AAU squad. Why? Because that AAU squad wears Adidas. Mm -hmm. The kid is now Adidas. But then that AAU program in Adidas is a feeder to Adidas colleges. We're not going to go to that school because they wear Nike, they wear Converse, they wear Reebok, they wear, there used to be a real, I mean, there was an actual sneaker war in the early 90s it was a re- there were six like major players the movie air kind of shows that a little bit do, do they i didn't yeah. see it a little bit it's oh, really so good, good movie too. a little bit not like you're saying but. but people don't realize that that 10 year old was groomed literally groomed for a certain sneaker brand for the aau to then the high school <laughs> because it was a feeder to get that kid to that college program so these sneaker companies were investing in 10 to 11 12 year olds wow that makes it me th- then it just makes it pop in my head this all the social media has been going on just in a different way because the way social media works now, you know, where they manipulate someone into like the shoe. Yeah. It worked the same way before, just a different way. Those kids were, were influencers. The, the 12 yeah. year, I mean, there's Nike schools, North Carolina, Michigan, that kid, we got to get him on that AAU team. So he's a Nike kid because then that's, you know, that's what I know. That's what, I mean, I see people all the time with Nike tattoos. <laughs> Crazy. Right, that's like the religion, but Nike's so brilliant. I mean, Phil Knight, that whole thing's brilliant because the Nike slogan, the swish, is universal. In China, it still says Nike. In English, it says Nike. In every language in the planet, because there's no letters, you don't need them. Nike's Nike's Nike. But if you look at who has been the face of Nike, it's always been the best of the best of the yeah. best. It was Tiger Woods, it was Michael Jordan, Serena Williams, Derek G. I mean, Kobe, the best of the best Aaron, of the best Aaron. of the best. Kobe signed with Adidas. And then, I, uh, originally. And yeah. then Kobe's Adidas deal, and Nike said, we got to have you. But And now Nike just gave uh, his alignment. daughter daughter shoes. Yeah. Um, the sneaker companies ran college basketball, ran AAU basketball for the whole thing of, one day we need him to be wearing ours as a pro because it's going to sell... It, a couple of years ago, as far as basketball shoes were concerned, Nike had 94% of the market. Mm. 94, which is out of 100 pair of basketball shoes sold, 94 of them were Nike brand, with the majority of them being under the Jordan brand, which is a subset, obviously, yeah. of Nike. Yeah. And what was like the other 0.2%? Then uh, it was Adidas. Under Armour, maybe a little bit. Curry. Under Armour barely cracked really? Yeah, wow. into it. Yeah, I thought they would have cracked a little bit more with Curry, but they're so damn not ugly. much. They're ugly. No, not much. Now you've been doing sports radio for how many years? I mean, I've been doing FM, hot talk radio, personality radio, and then at sports radio station. Um, started this show in 1999, and then moved to ESPN West Palm in 2013. So you've seen a lot of sports over the years. You've been in a lot of crazy events. What's some of the most memorable events you've been to that really stick in your head? Like, man, that was fucking awesome. I was there for that. Or I mean, I got maybe- to, yeah. Um, as far as work or just in life in general? Life in general, I guess, because you can do both. I've been, I've, yeah, I've been pretty blessed. I mean, I've seen anything that's ever happened significant, I saw it on TV. Because I watched TV my whole life. Everything that I know, I learned from TV. How to do this job, I learned from TV. But they'll show a moment, and they're like, "There's the back in 1994, the Hail Mary, Colorado, Michigan." Like I watched it on a Sony Watchman, <laughs> a pocket TV in Philly, crossing over Island Avenue, 
um, on my way to a Hooting the Blowfish concert at the TLA Hooting Theater. Hooting the Blowfish. <laughs> yeah, 1994. Yep. I September 24th. Saturday, September 24th, 1994. Good brain there. They were but as far as like, I got to be there. Yeah, I, I, I got to be, yeah, I got to be some cool places. Fight stuff in particular. Um, Jorge Masvidal with the flying knee. Oh. Ending that fight five seconds in. Yeah. Uh, T-Mobile Arena, I was there. Whoa. The night in the UFC in which the three challengers beat the three champions, the whole scoreboard yeah. changed <laughs> um, at Madison Square Garden, and that was 2017. I was, I was there. Um, I got to be at some cool stuff. Yeah. For sure. Five, top four. Yeah. Oh, Kurt Schilling's um, shutout, 1993, the uh, two nothing shutout over the Toronto Blue Jays. Kurt Schilling, I got to, I got to be Boy, there. That bring back memories. Kurt, Kurt Schilling, back when you could say his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So here's uh, the home team. So I just think is like if you could like look, you're talking about Tucker Carlson. You know, you know, like that's not like a normal sports. Correct. That's why it's cool. It's him? diverse. You just met him? So Tina, who we've mentioned many times. Yeah. Tina Tina's why I'm here. <laughs> Tina and Dean Thomas, my co host. <laughs> and and now they just do Monday and Tuesday on the show, which is a shame because we were together, the three of us, for the last two years? Two and a half? Three years. Wow. Um they Dean Dean is on the broadcast for UFC. So he's the coach corner analyst. And Tina was in New York for the weekend and she went to the fight card as well. Um, they're on the loading docks outside of Madison Square Garden and Tucker Carlson just kind of roaming around, I guess, by himself. And uh, he starts talking to them and then he's telling them stories about how he never thought he would be sexually attracted to a 55-year-old woman, but his wife is. He's into <laughs> he's it. Funny. He's a funny dude, man. He's strange. He's strange. Funny. Yeah. Strange. strange funny. But like, but like, cool, cool. Absolutely. But, you know, if, if I said to you, Donald Trump, Kid Rock, and Tucker right. Carlson walk into a cage fight, you think that's a setup for a joke. Right. But it's Saturday night. Trump, Trump Jr., Kid Rock, <laughs> Tucker Carlson walking into Madison Square Garden <laughs> for UFC. Yeah. It's not, not a joke. It's not a setup. It's what, what really happened. But no, like going back to that, we are on ESPN West Palm, but we are going to be talking about everything that is interesting, entertaining, and most of all, relatable to you. Tina today on the air had a theory that People that drive Teslas think they're better than everybody else. Ooh. Her experience has been she noticed <laughs> that people in Teslas think they have the right of way. That they, so, and we talk about like, agree with you. Yeah. Here, here's something that you'll hear on the air. If if you're in a car and you want it to be colder, do you tell the Uber driver can you turn the AC up or turn it down? I just don't say anything. Turn it up. But some people say turn it down, right? You, the temperature you want a higher yeah, look. Right. Turn it up, turn it down. Your toilet paper at home. Does it go mullet, roll Ooh. to the back, or does it go apron to the front? Under, right? It's under. Mine goes to the front. Everybody's different. But these are relatable things. Yeah. Right. Food. You keep you entertained TV, in the car. What, it's great. Celebrity stuff. Who you run into. I mean, our producer now is a kid named Christian. Christian Cat. CK is 25 years old. He's learning that his life is fascinating. <laughs> Seinfeld was a show about nothing. It's also the biggest sitcom in history. history. But an episode would be about whether or not somebody thought somebody was saw them picking their nose. An episode would be about something as simple as that. He was trying to scoop ice cream over the weekend at, at a Penn State party, and I guess that he missed like his bowl. So he panicked, and he just picked it with his hand. He scooped it with ice cream off the counter with his hand like a claw game, put it back in the bowl. Most people might slide it over, or they might put it in the bowl and throw it away and start over. Nope, he just snatched it with his hand. We're going to talk about things that are some sports, but a lot of life, a lot of things that are real, that are relatable, because it's just flow conversation with your friends. I've had listeners over the years stop me in public and say that we got them through the toughest times of their life. The loss of a child. Can't buy that. Um, a divorce. I've had multiple people tell me that they scheduled their chemotherapy around the hours of the show so they knew it was going to suck and they knew it was going to hurt and they're going to be sick as hell. Jesus. But they knew that they had something to look forward to. We were going to make them laugh, make them think, put things in perspective. Can't, money can't buy that, Josh. No, for sure. Um, so the idea is, you know, sports is part of it, but it's a small part of what we all find interesting, entertaining, engaging, want to talk about, want to, because we're their friends. We're, you know, it's a very intimate medium. It's radio. They can't see you. 
it's you're talking to one listener and you're not talking to thousands and thousands of people because that person's in that car alone and you're their companion. You're the people riding shotgun with them and they look forward to you. I had one woman, I remember when the show had left Clear Channel and it was before going to ESPN West Palm and I was in non-compete. I was in a Publix and this older woman, she had to be, I don't know, 65 to 70 ish. And she timidly asked me if I was me. And I said, yes. And she had tears in her eyes and you could tell that she was kind of emotional. And she said, I mean, you know, they're older when they say program instead mm-hmm. of show, right? Cause yeah, program. 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 Yeah, program. Yeah. I want to watch my program. program. She was yeah. shaky and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, I listened to your program every day for years and I loved you and your team so much. And one day you were gone and they didn't tell me where you went, yeah. and I didn't know where you went, and it was like losing a member of the family. Yeah, it's awesome. And I said, do you have Facebook? And she said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, good luck. <laughs> 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 because like Facebook became the place to tell everybody, here's where I am, here's where I am. Like, I did appearances off the air. I did, one guy who was, who was a big time radio executive, in fact, he was a dude that ran Clear Channel for South Florida, he, he gave me the best compliment. Actually, he hired me my first gig in radio, and I forgot this. I forgot he was the guy that hired me. And he reminded me of that years later. He's like, I hired you for... And I said, he said, yeah, that was me. He said, I've never seen anybody, when they were off the air, grow their brand, do things, instead of like, woe is me. Or th-. He said, you actually took it to another level via Facebook when they couldn't afford to keep you guys at Clear Channel before you went to ESPN. And I thought, like, you know, that was great. I guess I played it right. I guess I guessed right in how to position it. You picked the right card. I, I, I played right how to represent. This was also, you know, the spring, summer, fall of 2012. So it was a different time in so, everything. But when you're doing this five... So you're doing this five days a week right, for two hours. Job. Okay. Yep. So how do you prep for tomorrow? So you're done at six. Yep. So say you didn't come here. What's your night like into tomorrow? Because tomorrow you got to show it for. So what, what's that like? Jerry Seinfeld told Howard Stern that his life is torture because his life is constantly writing jokes, looking for jokes. Everything is possibly potentially a joke. And Stern's like, that sounds like torture. He says, yeah, but it's my torture. It's what I chose. I learned a long time ago that anything is show prep. Anything is show prep. Like you could have a booger right now in your nostril and the topic is I got to sit here and do a podcast, look at this guy for an hour and I can't stop. I tell myself, don't look at it. You don't have a booger, by the way. If you did, I want you to tell me and I would just pick but, it right. But a topic <laughs> on, and I'd say thank you. But a topic on the air could be as easy as when we come back, I didn't know whether or not I should tell a guy something and I had to sit there for an hour and not try and look at it. I'll tell you what it is when we come back. Now, you're that's curious. Good. Yeah, now that's you're good. That's so, the tease. The tease. So I'm teasing you. So what I can do then is yeah. remind you that John C. Cassidy, who's a great local family-owned company, if you need AC or plumbing care, repair, or maintenance, they're the guys that I trust. That's my people. And I can send that message right there. We go to break. We come back. And I remind you. I'm going to tell you in a moment. I sat next to a guy facing him for an hour and I didn't know whether or not I should say something or not. And I tried not to look at it, but I was like, so I'm tell you what that was. <laughs> and right now I'm going to tell you in that in between time right there that Ed Morse, you know, that's my buddy, Teddy Morse, his grandfather and his father ran the company and now he runs a company. And when he says you're backed by Morse, that means if something's not right, they're going to make it right because your endorsement, you Karen, you Mark, you Steve, whoever with your minivan, your whatever car you got, you letting your people know they took care of you is going to mean a whole lot more than some commercial on TV. So I got those two live reads in, and now I'm going to tell you that I'm doing a podcast, and we're sitting across from each other about two feet apart, and he's wearing a light pink golf shirt, <laughs> and he's got a gold Rolex date date with Roman numerals, and he's got his arms crossed, and he's tatted out in his left arm, and as he's sitting here about 18 inches away from me with his black headphones on and his black shirt microphone on a red arm appendage pointed directly at his mouth. I notice in his left nostril, there's a booger. And it's one of those kind of gooey ones. You know, the ones I'm talking about that aren't the hard ones. You're kind of, could you like pull like like a rubber band and it flies back? Right. And so I notice that when he inhales, it kind of disappears, but then it exhales. It's It's like a ligament. It's like a ligament. And I tell myself, don't look at it. Don't, but do I tell him, do I not? Because we're on camera. That's a topic. Yeah. Now, how would you get that? By paying attention to your life. Seinfeld was a show about nothing. The home team has always been 
kind of a show about nothing where there's things that we're going to talk about that tie it together. There's got to be some, you know, there's got to be some backbone to it, but we're going to meander off into because everyone can relate. I find amazing uh, listening. I love listening to sports talk radio, but like, you know, Stephen A. Smith, right? Uh, Skip Bayless, two guys that either you love them Mm -hmm. or you hate them. There's no in between. I kind of like them. You love them or hate them. But I talk to people and they'll be like, I fucking hate Stephen A. Smith. I hate Skip Bayless. And I'm like, do you still listen to them? They're like, yes. I'm like, they got you. Correct. No matter if you hate them or not, you're listening because you want to hear what they're saying to hate them more. How much... I mean, with your show, it's probably not the same, but having that villain, I guess, if you want to call it. Yeah, I chose that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good question. I, I chose to be, I, I always thought it was the bad guy. And they bad said, guy. well, in wrestling, it's called the heel. Yeah. So I just learned that not too long ago. I made the conscious choice in 1999 when I was going to join the legendary Love Doctors when they were flipping that format from rock with the love docs into FM hot talk. There was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of expectation. There were thousands of people that were like, do not invest in the 401k. You're not going to make it two months. This ain't going to work. It ain't going to last. What they didn't know, what I did know was that it was going to last for 25 years and then some. And I knew it would because if you just looked at the ratings, the morning show with a little bit of the talk guy and the rock music was doing like a four. This is Treasure Coast ratings. It's doing like a four share. And the Love Docs came on and they had like an 18 share. And then Afternoon Drive after them had like a six share. And then at nighttime, it had like a five share. So it doesn't take rocket scientists to go, well, what in this is working? Well, there's a huge demand for what these docs are so if you had someone that wasn't trying to be like them, but that understood what people found interesting in them, did it differently. And that's what we did. I didn't want to be them. They didn't want to be me. But what we did was something that was talk, person that calls, anything might happen. I didn't think there was going to be fame, world famous strippers in studio doing things in the middle of the afternoon with the window shades. <laughs> I, I yeah. didn't never imagine these things were going to happen. But they did. It got crazy. Um, the old Howard Stern research was people that love him listen 42 minutes. People that claim they despise him listen 58 minutes. Yeah, crazy. There was something to that. I made the decision that I was going to be the bad guy, the a-hole of radio. Because what I noticed was if you watch like the wrestling match, they cheer loud for the hero, but they boo even louder for the bad guy. Mm-hmm. Look what we just talked about Kobe Covington. Look what Kobe did. Kobe saved his whole career and became this global brand by doing what? Become by being the bad, bad guy. guy. By being the bad guy that resonated with the core of MAGA and taking the our service men and women, our military first. Because you can never go wrong playing that card. Never. Whether you mean it or not, if you played as a card. But you'd have to back it up, obviously, and showing that in real life. You can't have a cell phone video being rude to a soldier in the airport. Um, you can never go wrong with sick kids. You can right. never go wrong with, with yeah. dogs and pets and All animals. True. Yeah. And you can never go wrong with first responders, military, USA. You can pander, in fact, to that. So I was going to be the bad guy. And so it's shocking how many times, I don't meet them as many now as I used to, but I used to meet people weekly that I would meet at the mall. I used to go out and stuff. I'd stay home. And they would say, <laughs> you're so much nicer than I thought you are going to be. Or like even meeting family of show members. That say, like, I really thought, because on the air, I'm being a dick to your daughter. I'm being a dick to your son, your husband, your wife, your fiance, whoever. It's the show, the role. The personality. But, but what they know is, the smart people know, they know how big my heart is. And they know how much I've always helped and try to help people who needed it. Um, kids who were sick. You people who needed assistance. Charity, and you never say anything about it. Absolutely. But I always felt, I learned from Dr. Rich Dickerson, the love doctor, that if you're in a position that you can do something, you should. And that there's lots of ways you can help folks. And sometimes we help people by literally just letting the open the phone lines and saying, people, I know you want to help this. A woman called in. Her husband had died. She obviously was not very educated. She didn't have much. She was old. And her husband had died. And she was humbly asking for a bus ticket to, to take his cremated remains back to Michigan. And what happened was people 
called in wanting to donate. They donated thousands of dollars so she could fly, so she could have some bills caught up on. They didn't realize that she would, didn't have her bills paid and, and, and take care of, like, I mean, that's just the generosity of the people. That's nothing special about us. But what I learned is that I bet there's something that any of us can do to help someone else who then can do something to help everyone because we're all connected in the end. Yeah. One it's way like or another. pay it forward move. Or I'm in a position I can do something. Like, why not? And the smart people could see through it. But I would meet people all the time that would say, man, I love your show. You're a dick. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> but I love you. Let's face it. After a night with drinks, I don't bounce back the next day like I used to. I have to make a choice, either a great night or a great next day. That is until I found Z-Biotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Z-Biotics is the answer we've all been looking for. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut, where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol. Drink responsibly and get a good night's of sleep to feel your best tomorrow. Order Zbiotics now for your summertime barbecue, weddings, vacations, you name it. Go to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia or scan the QR code on the screen right now to get 15% off your first order when you use MSCS Media checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can stay prepared no matter the time or occasion. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee, so if you're ever unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash mscsmedia, use the code mscsmedia at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Breaking news, Manscaped now sells beard products. That's right. They are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shave your signature beard look. Now you can finally use Manscaped products to make your drapes match your carpet by going to manscaped.com and using code MSCS Media for 20% off and free shipping. No one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye to all the stubble trouble with Manscaped's Pro Beard Kit. It all starts with the Beard Hedger. This thing is a monster of fixing faces. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all with one guard. No more messing around in drawers, this color one, that color one, all with one guard. Plus it's waterproof, so you can shave in the shower and avoid all that hair in the sink. The Pro Kit doesn't end there though. First, there's the beard shampoo and conditioner. You need to remember your hair is different. Next, Manscaped's beard oil. Cap it off with beard balm. The Pro Kit also comes with three different gifts, a beard brush, comb and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress so get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code mscs media at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off and free shipping at manscaped.com use the code mscs media <laughs> and they got that i'm playing that that, that, that role and that, you guys if i'm yeah. right you end the show with something like that with bad guys say goodbye say goodnight bad guys yeah i mean the there was a couple ways. It was always every day above ground is a good day. That's right. it, it, we still do. As a reminder, listen, somebody had, I had the worst day ever. You know, I lost that client and I got a flat tire and I got passed over from that promotion, this bullshit. And they had the worst day. I had the worst day ever. Sucks. And while they're saying that, there's a woman who literally is trying to find gas money to take her 10 year old daughter to chemotherapy. Who got told she has a four percent chance to live? Yeah, you don't. You don't have the worst day. But perspective. Every yeah. day above ground is a good. If you're alive, you're still breathing. It's a good day. Some are just better than others, and you have to keep things in perspective. And I think the show's always been great about perspective, where you know, no matter what, keep this in mind. No matter what, keep that in mind. Um, we say that at the beginning of the show, and at the end, you know, so say goodnight to the bad guy. Good night, bad guy. That's just a line from Scarface. Right. So, you know, he, he's all drunk in the restaurant 
and he's say good night to the bad guy when you know they throw him out of the restaurant mm-hmm. or whatever. And so I'm the bad guy. Say good night to the bad guy. How did you become so good at detecting liars and body language and everything? Yeah, I, I saw quite a few quotes about, about that. Yeah, so, I, so like when you talk to somebody or you have a guest or you meet someone, how does your brain fire back and forth? Well, I took an interest in in college. Psychology was my minor. The human behavior, because I want to understand if if you can understand why people do what they do, you can influence what they do. And I was studying advertising. I was studying mass communication. Every I thought I was going to be like Don Draper on Mad Men. Communication. Before, I was going to be the guy that sat there in the advertising room and said, here's the slogan. Is that originally what you wanted to I do? I thought that's what I was going to do. I thought that's what I was going to be. The, the TV thing was by chance because a dude in the student union was like, you're the dude that hosts those parties, those events in the bars. And the, and I said, yeah. He said, man, we got an opening. On the, it's like Sports Center, and you should. And I thought, you know what? I should. So I did. It turned out I was pretty good at it. But not to go back, I just yep. wanted to ask you. I, I had read when you were 20, you didn't have any kids, no wife, no nothing. At 20, where was your head? In in the TV lane? Like, oh. how did you end up? At 20, it was, I want to stay in college forever. I just, hmm. I, I, yeah. I, rem- I remember waking up, I remember waking up in college in like a cold sweat panic because I thought like I was graduating. I had like a dream I was graduating that next week. And it was week. over? And then I, I remember, I remember <laughs> sitting up. I remember sitting up in my bed and counting the semesters. I was like, "All right, I got the rest of this year. And I got next year." I was like, "I got." I was like, "I got another year and a half." And being so relieved and going back, I remember vividly that one night. I didn't ever want to leave. I loved college. I loved fraternity. I loved what that was. What I do now is pretty close, because the events in which someone was on the mic, it was me, doing what it is I do now. The ball busting, the leading the stories and conversation and go around the horn and all that. But psychology being a minor, human behavior, body language wasn't really called nonverbal, wasn't really, but law enforcement utilized it. If you know, because people lie with their mouths and, and I swear to you, but body language doesn't lie. So if you can, I mean, what, what greater skill is there than knowing what someone's really thinking? If you ask 10 people what superpower other than time travel or flying do you wish you had, they almost always go, the ability to read minds. If, if you can read body language, you can read minds because that's what they're really thinking and feeling. They may not even realize it. So then the next you know, logical progression is nobody likes being lied to. Why do people have issues in relationships? What's the trust about? You're lying to me. You talk to your ex. And the DM, who are you DMing with? You're lying... If you know whether someone's lying to you, being deceptive or deceitful, what's more useful, powerful than that? Nothing. Nothing. You're, you're ahead of the game. I mean, if I did a seminar and said, I can teach you in three hours how to know exact when someone's what they're thinking, what they're actually meaning, and I can tell you, I can teach you if you're being lied to. People are like, sign me up for that. Sign now, me up. Now, for all the years. And you could apply that to anything. Of course. In business, there are people that are masters of nonverbal that, that used to be in the FBI, that used to be in the CIA, and now- There'll be Fortune 500 corporation negotiations. Oh, yeah. And they're just sitting there and, watching. And they're a consultant. Their entire job is sit there. Somewhere. And they'll talk about a $4 billion acquisition <laughs> of this or that. And they don't say anything. And they say, Mr. So-and-so is here. He's a colleague of ours. And he's monitoring your feet. Are your feet far apart? Are they close together? Yeah. He's mon- Are you moving your foot? Are you moving your foot when we talk about this part of the deal? Where are your hands? Right. What are you doing with your fingers? Are you leaning in? Or are you pushing back? They know, because then you can use that against you. Because then I know, it's like being able to see your cards in a poker game. Mm-hmm. And that's why poker players wear sunglasses and hats and wear headphones. So you can't necessarily see those tells that are universal. We don't learn body language. Um, people think like, oh, my, my kid saw me do it and he learned it. Blind children exhibit the same nonverbals <laughs> as adults. Yeah, so... It, it's, it's, your, yeah. it's part of your limbic brain. It's hmm. passed down through your DNA. They are traits that get passed down by survival. Like when people are shocked and horrified, why do they take their hands and put them over their mouth? If you remember January when DeMar Hamlin from the Bills was dead on the field, you know, they're trying to revive him nine minutes of CPR. And you see there's Josh Allen, people get their hands over their hands are cupped over their mouths. Why do we do that? Well, it turns out thousands of years ago, human beings, biggest threat were big cats you know, lions and tigers and cheetahs and jaguars and big cats. And they would sense humans to eat based on exhale, based on 
So putting your hands over your nose and mouth means that you're oh, wow. trying to save your own life. Oh. And you're shocked, you're scared, and you're protecting. And so by doing that, the animal back then would sense fear and know. You no, know, if you covered your mouth and your nose with, with your hands, you were terrified and you were doing that to protect yourself so you wouldn't be heard. Uh-oh. And so the breath wouldn't exhale. It doesn't make any sense why we do it now, but it's why, why does your dog circle, 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 circle before it lays down on the bed? Because 10,000 years ago, it had to to mat down the field. Well, this dog never had to. Why does he? It's in his limbic brain. Yep. Our body language says a whole lot. It says... Mouths lie. Body language doesn't. I, I, I'm going to trust someone's body language over their words 10 times out of 10. I like that. And, he did, yeah. and as far as deception and deceit, there's no body language. To, there's no... Joe Navarro is the man's name. He's the bodfather. He's like the inventor. He's like like the man who really focused in on body language and explained it. He was, a, he was an FBI agent for 25 years. In the early 70s, he was explaining, when they do this, that's what it means. When they do this, that's what it means. Joe Navarro says, you know, there's no Pinocchio effect. There's no physical thing that people do to indicate they're lying. There are things they do to show discomfort. Most of our body language really is comfort and discomfort. It can be one category or another. Sometimes somebody's uncomfortable with something and they show it. Other times it's just a self-soothing, self-pacifying hug or a touch or, you know, with their hands. The verbal cues are more important when it comes to lying deception and deceit so i'm fascinated by because who who wants to be bullshitted nobody who i mean i want to know whether or not i gotta you know whether it's a relationship i mean i've stayed single i've never been engaged or married people say well hi why 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 have you know well i know too much about body language <laughs> and deception and deceit i have a wonderful girlfriend now her nonverbals check out her verbals check out so so far so good yeah. rich cooper there's a guy we have rich cooper and he wrote the alpha male book and he had 20 flags and we oh, went through yeah. them with the flags. And the biggest one was the, com- well, to me was the committee. It's when you have a girlfriend or a wife or whatever, and it, they have their committee. Mm-hmm. So Tommy and his girlfriend, whoever we get in a fight about this cup, they go to the, whole and they got to go to the family, the friends, the whole committee. And then they come back from the committee. Well, they with, said, well the committee said, yeah. 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 Now, and that's uh, the ones you were smart enough to run from. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, it's hard to date me. I'm hard. To, I'm hard to date. Um, and I'm OK. I'm, I'm better alone. I, I like to be alone. And I've never felt the need. First of all, because of a, a tough childhood and life circumstances, part of my development is stunted anyway, is a early teen tween. So I never felt like a grown up. I never felt like I'm supposed to be getting I never felt like I don't come from a real core family where there's, you know, here's the expectation. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to have kids. Never the case. So for me, I was going to be with a woman. If she was worth being with. But if she wasn't, that's okay. I'll be with lots of women in a much less serious capacity. What were you going to say, Rob? No, I was going to say, for for all the years you've you've been uh, doing radio, and nowadays it seems like even on television everywhere, somebody says, I don't know, something. And it just gets, seems like it gets misconstrued or blown out of water, and then you're canceled. Are you ever afraid of that nowadays when you're on the radio that, man, I just might say that one thing, and it's going to offend somebody, and there I go. There goes everything. I mean, because so the short answer is I'm mindful of always what could be, but I have the opportunity to clarify. Right. So I have the opportunity, and we have the tape. And so in context, no. We've always made fun of pretty much everyone and everything that you can. So you're not showing. Also, I speak the truth. So I'm not afraid to tackle racism and sexism and homophobia. And I've always been, and you'd be shocked at the people that come up to you or that let you know, thank you for telling the truth. Thank you for letting people know. If you keep it real, then you don't have to worry about being canceled. When you have to worry about being canceled is when you are trying to uh, infuriate, instigate, cross a line. With that said, there's always the opportunity in which something can be grabbed by, you know, if, if someone powerful enough wants to make a deal, wants to get rid of, wants to find a way they, they, they can. Um, I'm blessed to work for a company that says, listen, you know, your Twitter is your Twitter. You do what you do. Be mindful of advertising partners, marketing partners that you represent as well as associations we have. But this whole lot, people are always like, oh, 
ESPN, they push an agenda, political agenda. You're told what to, you can't do this, you yeah, can't do that's that. That's why I brought that but up, John. Clear that's channel. Oh, th- there's this misconception that people have that and they do. the media's, I'm being told what, to, I've never once ever, ever been told what to say, what not to say. There was one time that I felt that it was a little bit of like an influence being pushed. And it was the early stages of the Iraqi invasion in 2003. And we were morning drive. We were morning radio. And the boss just let it be known to us. He said, you know, stations that are getting behind the troops in the action, they're seeing a real peak. They're seeing a real... And that speaks to patriotism, and I get that. But there was no, listen, here's our stance. Here's what you're going to say. And they don't do that at ESPN. We're not ESPN. We're good karma brands. We own and operate. ESPN West Palm, ESPN New York, LA, Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Madison. Um, and we now operate the entire radio network and podcast, sales and operations. So it's great for us. Awesome. But our culture is different. Our company is great. Our culture is great. Um, we're a marketing company that happens to be in radio, television, podcast. But there's never been a, here's what you're gonna. No, no, no. I, I, I always cringe when I get that response from someone on Twitter about, I, I had one the other day, I'm shocked you're allowed to say this considering you're from, people have no idea. They, they, it's a conspiracy theory they've heard or they just regurgitate something they saw on Facebook their uncle posted. Um, nobody's ever told me what I was supposed to think, what I was supposed to say, what I was not. And we take on real issues. But until you explained it, I thought that ESPN was like everyone else. Here's that, the, that you know the, the agenda is? Big pharma is the... Big tech, whatever they're paying the commercials, and they're okay because that's what the average person is going to think. Because so, every news station is. So here's here's what the agenda is: don't do anything to lose these advertisers, don't do anything to prevent new advertisers. It's only the advertising business. News Channel Five, our top story tonight: we're tracking the progress of Hurricane Hugo as it makes its way. That's right, live coverage. The news is not there to inform you. It's not an obligation to keep you educated. The news is there to sell commercials for storm shutters and for car dealers and for the dental place. It's going to replace your smile. Hmm. And what they realize is people take an interest in knowing those things. And so that's why news is now at 4 and 4.30 and 5 and 5.30. There's an interest in that. Well, if there's an interest in that, let's do it because that means we can sell commercials. All of this you're finding comes back to advertising. And so the agenda is real simple. Don't do things on the air to lose our advertisers or to prevent new advertisers. But I think you got mixed in, or ESPN per se, got mixed in with the Fox, the CNN, the CNBC, the MSNBC that we know is paid off. That they go to them and say, hey, uh, shy away from this, shy away from that. So I don't know you say paid off. So I'm going to disagree. I'm going to tell you that... Fox News Channel isn't paid off per se. What Fox News Channel did was realize, oh my God, Rush Limbaugh has his audience and they call themselves ditto heads. Ditto, ditto. Uh I agree, I agree. Preach, 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 preach. And what they realized was, you know what? People don't want to know the truth and they don't want to decide for themselves. They want someone to tell them that they're right. They want someone to tell them yeah. they're on the right but side Josh, of the argument. Josh, Josh, Confirmation. You can't sit here and tell me that Fox News or CNN has an advertiser, Pfizer, whoever it may be, Lily, spending a ton of money. Yep. And they don't go to them and say, hey, shy away from this, shy away from that. And then if the host doesn't, they're gone. You don't think that happens in TV news? Um, I think what happened was... When they realized that Rush Limbaugh was onto something and there was a great portion of the nation that just wanted someone to be like, I told you so. I t- see what I mean. See what I'm saying? It's called confirmation bias. And we all have it. Confirmation bias is something as human beings in which we will tend to skew towards believing the things that we want to be true and discounting the things that we don't want to be true. If you're a gambler, and last night you want to butt the Buffalo Bills, and there's one stat, and it says there's six and two against Denver against the spread their last eight. You're like, I want to bet. See, but if the other stat says 
They're also 0-6 against the spread in their last six games. Yeah, but they weren't against Denver. So you your mindset goes yeah. confirmation bias. Fox News Channel, brilliant in that they could present news in a fashion that made a whole population go, told you so. See, I told, particularly when social media then made uncles and aunts reveal themselves on Facebook with their political stance. <laughs> right. yeah. And nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to be wrong. Nobody wants to be T- proven wrong. TV went from like the facts, right? You know, unfortunately, three people were ki- killed Here's in a car accident today. This is what happened at this time and that to a talk show, a a show, yeah. a, a thing. And now people tune into CNN for whatever they believe in Fox or what they believe. And it's gone away from just the facts of what it is. And it's what like is going on a, in the Fox day. News Channel was really the first to say, we're going to play to this base. Because maybe we do have an agenda of we'd like, you know, we're going to do better if this party's in control and they'll know where to go and we'll get the, and, but then MSNBC said, okay, well, we'll, we're going to go to the other side. We're going to take these, because there's an audience there. Competition. And what are we trying to do? What are they really trying to do? They're trying to sell toilet paper commercials (laughs) and car commercials and Advil commercials because it's just the advertising business. All of it is. It bothered me on CNN when it said um, uh, something about like tired President Trump gives disappointing speech to small crowd or something where in the old days they wouldn't give you the adjectives. They would just give you the fact and let me decide. Like if you Uh, see the question with, mm -hmm. with Conor McGregor, I don't give any opinion there. I don't say you suck. You're not what you used to be. I state fact, 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 fact. Now, the headline gives you all kinds of influence. They're leaning to they're trying to right. they're making this guy look bad. They're making this guy look good. They're trying but again, that's playing to their core because they realize look, at ESPN, they've got minute by minute data. They've got minute by minute feedback. So if you watch Get Up with Mike Greenberg, talking about the Dallas Cowboys. Why are we talking so much about the Dallas Cowboys? Why are they talking about this time of day every day? What they learned is that when they did People kept watching. And then when they changed, people then went away. Or when they got into this topic, people went away or stayed away. So what they're doing is staying on Aaron Rodgers, the Jets, right. the Dallas Cowboys. Why are they talk so much about it? Because what they've, the old expression, move the needle, literally move, move the, needle. the needle. Literally. Yeah. Sometimes you see a political debate and they give the audience the little meter. And when they hear something they like, they turn it towards the right. And something they don't like, they turn to the left. And you watch in real time this politician say, when I'm president of the United States, there will be no mandatory need for health care. And then you see the spike and all of these conservatives, and they love what they're hearing. And they, So now you know what people want. And if I can give them what they want, they're more prone to see the commercial Engage for that right. minivan, for that cruise oh, back to the ads yep. it's th- th- the entire yeah. world is based on the advertising business it's like right now for you guys i'm sure you've talked about on the air is taylor swift everything i see taylor swift yeah, taylor well, swift well, what's your take taylor swift that? is eating chicken nuggets <laughs> i gotta hear Josh taylor knows. swift is doing uh, this i'm like this. enough of fucking taylor <laughs> swift but He's then go, you, you turn on the TV, <laughs> there's Taylor Swift. He's got oh, she's wearing a purple scarf today. Fantastic. I see some body language, Fuck Josh. Taylor Josh Swift. He's a body language. Taylor Swift. Yeah. Rob, Josh, he's ready. We're always exhibiting <laughs> body language. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, here's the thing. God. So there's two ways to look at it. Number one, you, you got to think, you've always got to be thinking, I don't want to lose the people I got. I just want to keep them longer than they planned right. and bring new people. The NFL. Ugh. And the networks realized, holy shit. The, first of all, yeah. young people don't like football. Kids under the age of 16 aren't interested in football. And that's why they have to play 60 programs and they disguise it as fitness and exercise. And the flag football initiative with the NFL. Because they realize that there's a whole generation now that think the game is dangerous. And they don't want CTE and concussions. And they don't like the game. They don't understand it. They don't care. And the NFL needs fans to keep growing generation, generation. So the NFL saw this and they were like, she has a very young and also very female fan base. The two that we don't have that we want. Right. How can we get them 
to watch the games to take an interest in a player in the team so we know it's Travis Kelsey, we know it's Kansas City Chiefs. The NFL was then pushing an agenda to the networks and asked the networks, can you air this promo for her movie inside your studio show, not during the commercial break? NBC did it. Somebody else did it. Somebody else said, no, thank you, we're good. The league is telling their partner, we would appreciate it if, you know, you would, keep in mind, you know, NFL broadcast rights are about to get real interesting with streaming. Because Amazon changed the game already with Thursday night. Right. But these are billions and billions of dollars as to where it is. Sunday Ticket only existed on DirecTV from day one in 1994. This is the first year. Not only is it not on cable YouTube. or on satellite, it's streaming only. Uh, YouTube TV is YouTube, which is owned by Google. They bought the rights. So now I don't even need cable. I don't need to, I can watch on my phone. I can, everything has changed, which is great for the younger demo. But how do we get them to care about football? There's a whole, I promise you, there's a whole bunch of little girls and boys and teen to early 20 girls and boys this year right. that are getting a Travis Kelsey jersey or a Kansas City Chiefs Swift jersey that never before. Now they have an emotional investment. But people would ask me why they would fight with me. What does Taylor Swift care? She has a lot of money. What's, what's the NFL care? Because if you have a lot of money, a lot of power, you still can have more. So, so, so on that topic, then now, now we're talking about Taylor Swift. Of course, you get stuck in it. How do you do? You think it's a real relationship? Meaning they it's, love it each sure other. It looks like it now. You think so? It, I, it absolutely looks like it now. Yeah, and Tina's shaking her head. She's in studio here now. I don't think so. Don't Tina, think so? Tina, no, Tina's shaking her head because from the beginning, she's like, this is a real relationship. I don't think so. It, to me, it, it really felt like maybe these two people were kind of getting to know each other, but publicists and organizations, because you have a team, you understand? He even has publicists and a PR team and marketing manager, but her team is, like a te- is an office. It's people from the music side, people from the licensing side, people from the movie side, people from her projects and investments outside. And I know this because Serena Williams was a friend of mine and you, it's like how many agents, how many people from how many different, co- the, the early stages of seeing them together, it was obvious they weren't that comfortable being public or maybe it wasn't quite really just that. But then she's at his game, but celebrities go to games and concerts and they stand in a position where she was standing in the middle of the window Right in front. The game was 42 nothing. He scores a touchdown. She's going crazy. The NFL benefits from it. Ratings are through the roof. She yeah. benefits from nothing. it. Yeah. It became the most watched game in that demo in the last whatever years. The game was 42 to nothing against the Chicago Bears that are a terrible team. The only explanation was the Swift effect. She moves the needle like nobody's business. She has a global impact on economies because... People can't get tickets to a concert. They fly to a different city, different state, different country. Her they economic, were flying to London to see her because there was like there was a sale on London, on tickets to London, and everybody went to London because uh, everybody could get one here. I don't understand the story. The story that I read was that she has an economic impact. That's like a mini Olympics. Chad Focus. I mean, yeah, she no, changes she the game. Um, now you see them together pretty clearly. There's I'm with you, Josh, because I say, well, what benefit is it for her? Okay, she right. she gets but there into was okay. There is she gets into the NFL, so now she gets more of a, a genre that she maybe didn't have, but not that. Do you, do you know? Do I you know, think it's real. Do you know many celebrities? Do, do you I know know them? Know yeah. them like yeah. personally? Yeah, I am not right no, now. Handful. The, the the people that I know that are like first name around the world, people know. Um, they like to be around other famous people, and they like for everyone to be talking about them, and they like to make sure that because they're so afraid of moving down the list so afraid of being on the red carpet in an event and they and they go oh, thank you it's because so-and-so is coming taylor swift knows that where she is right now is impossible to maintain the only way you can maintain is by dying i mean the only music stars that have maintained that yeah, have died, died. Yeah. that the, you know hendrix or cobain or michael the prince it's impossible to maintain that so she had a lot to gain from it like for example Super Bowl halftime show. She had a lot to gain from it. Like, Good point, because that's guaranteed. Her movie's coming out. And there's a whole bunch of guys that didn't know it was coming out. They were going to buy tickets for their daughters or their girlfriends, their wives, or for their boyfriends or whatever situation that weren't aware. 
the football crowd not it's like chocolate and peanut butter like the old Reese's commercial <laughs> right. where it's like you you have <laughs> peanut butter on my chocolate you got chocolate on my peanut butter it's like whoa um everybody benefited from those two in that thing well it, it, it was interesting when she came to uh philadelphia before the nfl season started the eagles had just signed or traded for deandre swift right so he took number zero was his jersey switched to number zero so they had just started selling the jerseys and she was coming in two days they sold out of all deandre swift jerseys of course because they, they just wanted the swift of course. And it was an Eagles. And she's actually an Eagle. Well, now probably a Chiefs fan, but she is an Eagles fan. She's from Reading, Pennsylvania. It's like, you know. Yeah. So you don't think it's real. You do. I don't think it's real. I, 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 th- I think. Why don't you think it's real? No, she does. She oh, always you do from the beginning. It's real? Oh, okay. From the beginning. From the very beginning. She's like, they yeah. like each other. This is a real relationship. It's not. Because I'm like, this is a publicity. This is. Yeah. There was enough there for it to be obvious that there was involvement from parties saying, do you understand together on this? The NFL wanted it. The networks wanted it. Her people wanted it. The movie studio people wanted it. For Kelsey, he likes attention. He likes to elevate his brand, obviously. This year, Travis Kelsey is in six different ad campaigns. Well, I went to the podcast rankings, and I even asked him. I Number looked, one. and I go, what the hell? Well, yeah, who is this it. guy? Him and his brother. I said, who is this? I asked, right? Yeah. I said, who is this? Who, and, where did this and come who from? made that happen? Well, Swift, the Swifties. I know, I can because believe. every one of those little boys and girls and or fans yeah. wanted. Maybe he's going to say something. Maybe there's a cue, a hint, a clue. You know, back in the day, I found out I was doing uh, TV sports talk here in the very beginning, and I was listening to these love doctors, and I was like, "This show's I don't know what it is, but it's ridiculous," and I've never heard anything like it. And then one day, a guy called in and asked about me. My stomach dropped. And my heart sank. And I thought they're going to say, who? I don't ever, I never heard of that. Yeah. And the main guy that I mentioned, Rich Dickerson, Dr. Rich, he, my, I remember sitting in my car and I was like, and he said, that guy is too good and too smart to be, I don't know why he's here, but he won't be here for long. I can promise you that. You get more information the first five minutes of his show than an hour at Sports Center. And I remember feeling like so validated. Wow. And so I was like, wait a minute. He watches, and then some people are like, who, what? There was no way these people knew who I was, but he did. So then during my little half hour between 7.30 and 8 o'clock at night, I might drop a little Love Doctor reference thing that was inconspicuous enough that make you wonder. One of the guys, once upon a time, you know, Dr. Glenn admitted that he had peed in the soap dispenser <laughs> in the men's room <laughs> at the IHOP in Vero Beach. So I remember saying something on the air where it was in the middle of a rant about something, and I'm like, man, they play dirtier than the soap dispenser at IHOP and Vero, probably. <laughs> and then, then I listened to Love Docs the next day, and people calling in going, were you watching? Did you hear? There's no way you said that by coincidence. But I never let them know that I was a fan. Never let them know I was listening. I played it so smart, which led to then getting to be a guest, which led to them saying, wow. I want to... Which I'm the only reason I'm here today is because, literally, I found out that he watched, and then they were talking about, and I pretended that I played it like that. Otherwise, none of this would have happened. Isn't it crazy how one thing leads to another, leads to another? How was your time at iHeart? What what was it like? We had a lot of success. We had tremendous success. Is Um, it a lot different uh, atmosphere than ESPN? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because Clear Channel, iHeart, is an old radio company. They've been around forever. And and all that matters is, you know, is dollars. And people get mistreated and culture's terrible, and people shouldn't, it doesn't matter, they can get away with it because he's a terrible person, he said this to that, but he, but he makes a lot of money for sales departments. So at ESPN West Palm, again, good comer brands, culture overall, good people, good, decent human beings that are good teammates, that get the shared mission and purpose, and then they're taught how to do jobs, and they're very good at their jobs, but they're better human beings. So there's no comparison. To give you an example, when... When my show was eliminated at Clear Channel, iHeart, we were number one in the ratings. Out of 63 possible rankings, we were number one. Persons, 2554. Men, 2554. So at least when that happened and the media came asking, what the, at least they were honest. I'll give the guy credit. He said, this was not based on performance. It was a business decision made by Texas because San Antonio laid off like 
1,200 people that day, and they needed to get rid of people that had, I had like six weeks paid vacation. I had like 30 sick days a month paid. I had health insurance, life insurance, 401k match. I had all that stuff, which on paper goes, like he's a liability, and so does his producer, so his co-host. Wow. And so what they did was they, they, they did away with our jobs. Another show that was two hours a day, they made them work four hours, same pay. And then the other two hours they made up by replaying part of a recorded morning show, playing that in the nighttime to make up for the other two hours. So that was like an example of how could I do any better than number one? You guys should be killing it with this. Doesn't matter because Texas says we have to cut cut I some have corners. Never heard one good thing about no. IR. Not one good thing and it's I've a talked big, to 20, it's, 30 a big it's a big old antiquated radio company. As a result, they'll die. You know, the app, they got ahead of it a little bit with that, but like waking up and knowing that you're not, like with our company, if, if, if you're not doing great at that role, they're like, we believe in you. We're going to try a different role for you. Think about that. To give you more opportunity. Because no one's like, well, you know, you're not great at this. So we're going to let you go. No, no. We believe in you as a person we're going to find something else for you to do that we think you're going to be great at. And if you're not, we're going to try something else. Sounds family-oriented. It's, it's a place it, I would want to be. It's but. investing in people is what yeah. it is. It's realizing, identifying the good people, the loyal people, the decent people that are that are going to be an asset to your company. You know, there's the the old, like, strength and weakness finder, right? And a lot of companies are like, well, let's find your weaknesses and we'll work on them. Our company says, no, let's find your strengths, make them even better. Forget your weaknesses, because they're bringing this for a reason. We're going to take your strengths, make them stronger. Shit, that's impressive, man. Yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> it's it's, it's that a different way like to think. That. It's wow. a different way to. I mean, I mean, this is a little company that started 26 years ago by Craig Carmazin with a little AM in Wisconsin, and now here you are, and we are running. Not only do we own ESPN New York, LA, Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Gradual. Madison, West Palm, but we're operating the entire radio network. And the podcast network and overseeing sales for all of it. So what does that tell you about the little guy telling Walt Disney, we'll take care of that? Yeah. Telling tell Disney, we'll, we'll take care of that for you. And then do you have anyone that you, you know, growing up or, or in your early days of radio that that's a guy you looked up to? You wanted to be just like that guy. You heard that voice. You saw it. <laughs> I mean, was there anybody that really was an inspiration? I, I didn't plan on doing this. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was going to do this. So it wasn't a case of what I get on the radio. There was a morning show in Rochester, New York, Brother Wee's and the Morning Circus. And this they just talked about real stuff. And they called people out. If Tommy was hung over, like, what it was just real. There's not like scripted, you know, bits and shtick. I respected that. I heard some stern when I was in college. And I was like, mind blown. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is compelling it's fascinating you don't want to get out of the car and then we watched a documentary at work not long ago because craig carmazin his father mel carmazin is a radio titan oh, who is howard stern's boss mm -hmm. and in that stern says i want to make it impossible this was like night footage from like 1983 i want to make it impossible for you to get out of your car and make it impossible for you to stop listening and why is that so you hear the commercials and he did right. because I, didn't wanna, I didn't get out of my car either it's all about <laughs> Ad the advertising business yeah. All of it. And, and you have that, it's not that raspy voice or whatever. Yeah, my voice is have. raspy. Do you you have, have it and you're so quick, <clears throat> yeah. you're quick. So you can sneak something in quick, I used catch to it, understand it, and move on, and you don't even know but what it's just a, But it's a, in, it's good. You know, not, not, you know, you have an, an excellent <laughs> voice. You have that, like, sexy, sexy voice. Well, thank you so do, much. Do you, get, do you get women that, you know, call in and just like to hear you talk to them on the, the radio? The, the mic's at the old place. <laughs> No, no. We, we, you know what? We don't even ask for callers anymore. Callers have gotten so bad. Callers used to be, callers used to be the lifeblood of the show. But that was the old days. Um, callers have changed. Calling has changed. Um, the microphone settings, like the processing, years ago, made it a little deeper, a little bassier. And you also knew how to manipulate it to make it. So there are women like, oh my God, your voice is yeah, sure. There was some of that. Um, now this, now you just hear like the raw naked voice. So it's this. It's a little raspier. It's a little more spent. I got an email one time from oh, this was years ago. Harley Davidson of the Southeast. Oh, I read that. And the guy said something about um, we're looking for a new voice for Harley Davidson, 
and they that sounds like they gargle with gravel and broken glass. <laughs> and we think you're our guy. You were flattered. And so yeah, so I went in the production room with the script they wrote. Harley Davidson. Like I can do the movie trailer, you can get ready this summer. You know, you can screw around with that yeah, stuff. I'd be flattered. Yeah. yeah. Tell me I have glass in my throat and tell me to do a Harley like commercial. You, like Let's you, go. It said gargle with broken glass and <laughs> gravel. Gravelly. Harley <laughs> Davidson, South Florida. <laughs> And it also seems like you have, again, we know, but you have fun. We we were at, and this is where I said to Tommy, I'm like, you know who Josh is because we were at Wings, Wheels, and Fashion with Victor Concepcion. It's a great party. This year was a little rough. Great party. Well, he got sick, right? Yeah. got sick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Appendicitis. Yeah. 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 Victor did. But- you know, you see you on stage, you're you're actively involved, and you're having, f- it's not a fake. You seem like you're having fun with the, the things. Why would done. I do it? It's volunteer work. And if, you're, I'm not, if I'm not going to have fun, I'm not, not going right. to be fun for a good purpose. I'm not going to do it. And you remember, you remember you. When I, when be me and Rob were coming here, yeah. I, 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 like, you know I mean, we is. talked before we came on, and yeah. I said, I, 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 did I hang out with him? Like, I know him somehow. And, events. And yeah, 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 he said, uh. I used to do a ton more events than I do now. Victor, and God bless him, he still does. Yeah. I used to MC host participate in 55 a year and now maybe i do seven yeah i mean literally and i'm so happy to cut that way way down way back it was at a point that like you're you know attending the opening of an envelope like (laughs) as the old joke says yeah um i don't do nearly as many events but good cause and good times always you know if you can have a good time for a greater cause why wouldn't you right Going back to Stern real quick, when he went to Sirius, mm-hmm. did that have an effect on sports, on FM radio? Like, when he, like when did that went, just shift the whole thing for a, a period of time? When he went to uh, Satellite, people were like, ooh, will that work? Will it not work? But that was an age still in which, you know, like FM, you know, talk, morning shows are still healthy. Still strong. It still yeah. are. To the, to, still are. You know, 15 years later, whatever it is now, it's even longer than that. Wow, it's even longer than that. Um but what it did, though, was it made some of us more valuable because then there were stations that needed a morning show, mm-hmm. that needed someone that could do that. For example, on the Real Radio Network in Orlando, it was Stern in the morning, Monsters of the Midday, Monsters. and then the Love yeah. Ducks. And in West wow. Palm Beach, it was me instead of Stern. And then it was Monsters of the Midday, and it was Love Docs instead of um, Jim Phillips they had there. So it... When, when, when what were Stern, your hours, Josh? What were your six hours? to ten. Oh gosh, what time Morning do you drive. have to be in there? I'd walk in at five fifty-two. What time yeah. do you go to bed? I tried to go to bed at ten thirty, but it never worked. Never worked. No, it was miserable. It was miserable because I'm a young guy and a single that's, guy, yeah, and I was enjoying all. I mean, when I say I was enjoying like the success of like the year two thousand, was just we were rock stars, legitimately that didn't have any musical talent, but we had. <laughs> All these appearances where hundreds of people wanted you to sign stuff. And there was the it was, the money was easy. And there was obviously invitations to everything. People wanted to give you everything and they wanted to be. So there's all those perils you got to kind of navigate. But then I get word that, all right, we're going to give you a three-year deal and you're going to go do mornings. And I'm like, no, I don't want to. Like, you have to. Here's what we're doing. I'm like, I don't want to. Because it meant, I mean, for me, it was like, it meant throwing away like my life. I'm not a morning person. I'm a night person, and I was loving my life. I was loving my job, and also we're caller driven. It's the whole thing. Who's calling in the morning? Who's? And I got to compete now with all these shows that have. I got to compete with. I got to compete head to head with Howard Stern, out of Miami, Big One Hundred Six. I got to compete what with Bob and Tom. I got to compete head to head. I miss too, right? Didn't this, you? Yeah, absolutely. The, every one of them. Oh. We're in the afternoon drive. There may have been one other, two other talk personality type shows, but no, man, it's like mine to lose. It was miserable, and I could not wait to get out of it. People are like, you should be excited. Morning drive, prime time. No Put thanks. me back in the afternoon. Yeah, no That's thanks. all I ever wanted. I literally told my boss, I said, I'll take a 50% salary pay <laughs> I'll take a 50% salary pay I don't care. How many years did you do that, <laughs> that for? Morning drive? Yeah. March 5th, 2001 to, uh, uh, to late th- August 2003. That's still that's still uh, two years of hell and then and a half. Just one, oh, one, one, two last things. Where do you see yourself in the next? I know five years. You still still doing what you're doing. Still, I, you know, still I think about I, I think about that sometimes. I do because, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, some aspect of communicating, some aspect of conveying opinion, thought, information, 
for certain. I love what I do and I love who I do it with and for. I mean, I got asked a long time ago by many people, why did you stay in West Palm Beach? Because for me, it was just like Goldilocks, like that bed's too big, that bed's too small. This one just fits. The, the, it's the Goldilocks, the bear, right? Yeah. This one's just right. Um, it was like, it just, it just felt right. Sometimes I think I should have tried to do more. I should have aimed for more. I should have had an agent, should have had a, I haven't had a resume. I haven't had a resume since 1998. Yeah, but you I don't have anything. I don't have a tape since 1998. Yeah, but Josh, you don't like just sitting across from you and getting to know you. You don't seem like you have a headache. You don't seem stressed no. out. You don't no. seem irritated. And if you would have got an agent and all that other stuff, I, I think you might feel a little bit different. But Maybe. there are, but there are times though, because the problem is I know that I could have done so much more. I know that I should have done other stuff as well. So there are times like we'd be at Super Bowl Radio Row. And I'd see setups and things for other, and I'm like, I could easily, I should easily be. But, so the part of me now is at that stage of my life where I say, like, the comfortable was great, and the easy was great, but I'm regretting that I didn't do more, tr I mean, because I know I could have. You still got time, you act like you're never in a wheelchair. Late. It's never too late to become what you might have been. Pull up uh, tab five. Now, you sustain this for this long, and <clears throat> this is for any career, anybody watching, anybody maybe down. You've done FM radio through the shit. What kept you going when it got tough, all the transitions? Never got tough. Switch, I mean, okay, when things, all the changes. To you, it didn't get tough. But if we bring in a thousand people that did the radio, probably 90% of them are like, well, it's rough. I mean, so I, I don't know. I, I, like, where'd you get your drive? I, well, I, f f you know, probably fear of failure um, and survival. I'm in survival mode. My, that's my personality type, unfortunately, for better or for worse, because of childhood life experience. So all I know is keep going, figure it out, make it happen. You keep going, figure it out, make it happen. Keep Just keep going. You got to, I, I, I figured out what people find interesting. And I figured out that that wasn't me talking about me, gloating about me. Show, the show now is so much little about one time, me, I, it's so little about that now. And so much more about something else that everyone is aware of that is somehow relatable. And then I'll get my opinion, my take, or the teaching. When he says this, here's what he really means. Because if you figure out kind of how to do it, well then, that doesn't change. What people want does, they want, things to move faster and they want um you know certainly the way it's packaged it's harder than ever to get people's attention keep their attention because now you gotta be boom. quick you You're gotta fine. be boom, boom, in, boom in 2012 there was a five percent decrease in chewing gum sales hmm. and the gum industry is like whoa why five percent that's a big drop five percent sales decrease 2012 over 11 why what the hell and I ask people all the time, what do you think it was? What do you think it was? Why? I mean, Year over. Year over 12 to 11, I think it was. Just a dumb answer. Uh, social media. Social media. That's not that dumb of an answer. Smartphones. You say smartphones. Because I say, if you're, not going, if you're not going anywhere, maybe you don't chew gum because you don't care about your breath. That's not it. You're not going on a date. So you had the first part right. Okay, let's just stick with my first majority, part. A majority of gum is an impulse purchase. You're standing in line at a checkout. You're buying gas. You're in uh, Target. You're in sense. Publix. All those things are lined up there. So when people 12. when people didn't have their smartphone to check then first their Facebook and then, you know, other apps and such and email, what did you do in line? You looked around, you looked around, you looked around, and you grabbed some gum. And that was the end of the story. Just try to figure out that correlation. Yeah. That's what it was. That's interesting. It is hard to get their attention. It is hard to keep their attention. You have to continue to find ways to do just that. You'd love a captive audience. You'd love someone to be stuck in their car. And, you know, there'd be a traffic jam or an accident that nobody hopefully got hurt in, but, you know, it's tying up. You'd love for that to keep your audience captive. But if people like you, if they like the show, they want to know today what you're going to say, mm -hmm. what analogy you're going to make, what joke you're going to crack, what punchline you're going to have. So you have to, you know, become the fabric. They are, you are, they are all intertwined. And then they stay with you for better or worse. Obviously, right? Obviously. Let's go let's go through some of the Instagram. 
scroll through this, Rob? Oh, what is former world champion? Where did this come from? LLC. Yeah, that's the name of my company. So my, my company and my Instagram is the former world champion. Um, that came from a caller to the old show in like 2004 or five who was calling in, busting my balls. He said, look at you. You used to take limos to all your appearances every week. You used to autograph the people want pictures of you. You used to get to do this, that, whatever. You're like a former world champion, like the boxer has been. You're like the guy that, oh, but I was. I used to be. I was the champion. So it's self-deprecating that, I, that I'm that i the former world champion and that, yeah, I get it. Like, I get it. Some of you think, like, oh, I was a big deal and I'm not a big deal anymore. And so that's where that comes from. I highly disagree with that. And, and how there's did, Tina. Look, there's <clears throat> Tina right there. Oh, okay. We're past Tina's bedtime, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Tina, Tina, <laughs> Tina got roped into this because I no longer own a car, and uh, Tina co-hosts the show. And you uh, and she talked to the gym, so I said, "All right, I'll go do the podcast. You got to come with me in case they're going to try and sell me into traffic." <laughs> I don't know these people. Now, how'd you come up with the team? How'd you come up? You know, you, Josh, Tina, or how did that? I didn't, How did everything come together? They put it together, like they they. So in twenty, I got there January first, twenty thirteen, and then they trusted me to do the home team brand. Not till September of twenty thirteen. So there were nine months in which it was our way slow and our way is into. And I'm like, we're missing out on this advertiser that. And they're like, we know, we know, we know. And they put culture ahead of those advertisers that were like, when are you getting back on? We want to be with you. So that showed that they they walk the walk. Not just talk the talk. And so in 2014-ish, the president of the company now, who Steve Poltziner, who oversaw West Palm Beach primarily, he was like, um, we got to bring in one of your people. You can bring in one of your people from the outside. I said, they don't have to have radio? He said, no. They can be someone you used to work with, someone you didn't, but one of your people. That is you, that is, that you think. And so I said, all right. And that was Dean Thomas. The gentleman that you see there mm -hmm. on the podcast. Um, he had no media experience. He was on The Ultimate Fighter um, on Spike TV as a participant. But he used to come on my show at the old station, and I knew that he was funny. I knew he was interesting. And I knew that people found him funny and interesting because sometimes people would say, who's that comedian that was on? I got to go see him. I said, he's not a comedian. But we had a rapport. Sometimes you just have an on-air chemistry. And then off the air, maybe you're not even friends. Maybe off there they don't even necessarily you like each other. But there are certain teams that have that, like Robin and Howard have a chemistry. Mike and the Mad Dog had that chemistry. There's just a flow sometimes where it's me plus you is one plus one equals three. And he just knew how to be a showman. He just knew how to be funny and interesting and play along. Pull a clip of, uh, of him from my Instagram. We'll pull a clip of him. Of uh, Dean? Yeah. So you bring Dean in, and then when does Tina come in? Tina came in because Tina was an intern um, young, and then Tina became a teammate. She was an intern. They says, will you work? with?" And then you, she was working before you were 21, right? You were 20. So she was a – so then Tina had roles within the company, and then um, circumstances were changing within the show and television coverage, and then the boss – said, um, you know, for a producer for the show. And I was always partial to having a female voice, a female perspective, a female voice. But they had to be... Couldn't move. You, you want a female that all the guys think is a cool chick. Never that she's entitled, never that she's stuck up, never she thinks she's all that. It's going to be a woman who, strong enough, stand up for herself. Nobody wants to hear me bullying the 24-year-old, you know, five-foot, three-inch blonde girl. We know what they do want to hear? her bullying me. Mm -hmm. They want to hear her shutting me down, yep. making fun of me. They love that because I'm the a-hole of radio. Right. And then Tina was proposed and I said, absolutely. <laughs> Let's, but she was very shy. She was timid as far as on air. And so we told her for months leading up to you, on the air, got to do this. I'm telling you right now, got to be this, can't be that. And then we got on the air and she did that for, she played by the rules for like a week and then she just started being herself. <laughs> and then she being herself, but it was the perfect self and then it was like, it just worked. It just Tina, worked. Tina, Dean, and I, which is still Mondays and Tuesdays, four to six, uh, you know, daily. Mm -hmm. um, it's just Monday and Tuesday now. But that core three, there's just a, there's a flow. There's a chemistry. And 
for me, three is the magic number because it means that somebody's always going to be on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. You got, the, you got the triangle. There's two votes one way and one way. Maybe all three are an ingredient. Maybe all three agree, but otherwise there's a, there's somebody breaks a tie. Yeah. I got one last thing. I move. know, we, I know move, Tina's got to get home. She, uh, We're past gym, her bedtime. Jim early tomorrow. Yep. The, We're uh, night guys. By the way, that picture is, that picture's from, that's from maybe, that's probably February of 2013. That's a great, I like that. I and, like. um, you're and you're only five eight. When I stand up straight, I am. But Tommy, but tell me, how tall are you? Five eight and a half. You guys are in a battle. <laughs> so yeah, for the, for the height here. We did a thing where they tested our um our DNA, our telomeres, and the telomere length. <laughs> you have sixteen <laughs> drinks a week. He's got two. <laughs> and that's when he used to drink a little bit. <laughs> um, that that's uh, the telomere that indicates it's like your genetic, like how old you really are. Right, right. Like a car can look great, yeah. but how many miles are on it? So your telomeres indicate like how youthful you are or old you are for your biological age. And then you can rank what percentage you are. And it turned out I was biologically younger than Dean wow. and I was in a more exclusive um, bracket <laughs> than Dean, who is the professional athlete. Right. At this right. point, he was still, he still had a fight left in him. I think he had one fight after this picture and after this Thing. That's fantastic. It. So, and he hated it because it was like, dog, I'm, t I'm a freak of nature. I'm a genetic freak. And you know, like you look good, but, but you can see like, when you look at my face, you should wear a t-shirt that was uh, uh, that test coming back that, that you're, <laughs> that, I, I wear that every day. The test was 2014, 2015. And that picture is early 2013. So that picture is like 11 years old. I'd have the t-shirt remade so, for 23, 24, 25. <laughs> your, your last thing, your hot take here. You got the, Halfway through the NFL season, looking at it right now, who is in your Super Bowl and who wins? Yeah, you'll like this answer because Philadelphia looks like they'll play in the NFC Championship game again. I think the Niners are real, and I think the Eagles are real. And on the AFC, I think that's wide open. I mean, it leans Chiefs, obviously, but I'm not so sure. I could see um, several other teams, including Miami. Um, I think Buffalo now is a, has a problem. Um, in the South, Houston's going to ruin people's seasons, right. but they're not going to compete, you know, so I'm not worried about that division whatsoever. I expected more from the Chargers. I really did. So yeah. Miami is a problem. And I mean, Baltimore gives away these games, these fourth quarter leads. Nobody's blown more than they have seven in the last two seasons. Um, I was on the wrong side of those every time. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I didn't once benefit. Actually, no, <laughs> one, no, once I did when Miami came back last year. Against Baltimore, I think I did. Um, when they blew like a 20-point lead. But um, Baltimore is real. Um, if Deshaun Watson doesn't lose games for Cleveland, they're going to be a problem in that division. <clears throat> Miami's a problem. But really, it looks like Niners and your Eagles. Good. That's my feel. What do you think about NBA next year? Who cares? <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know. Who cares? I just looked and saw Kobe in the side. Kobe, I, took I know that was your guy. He he was, was, I took that one off your Instagram. He was the most, as I said, the most confident. And I mean, not fake confidence. He was the most con He would walk into a room where it'd be TV people and executives. And he was a junior in high school. And he knew that he was the man. He didn't have that yes sir, no sir kind of a, he'd lick his lips, <laughs> he put his head back, and he knew that all eyes were on him. And he knew in Philadelphia, WIP, mm -hmm. you know, Eagles, you know, like, they had issues. Flyers, Eric Lindros. Mm -hmm. The Phillies were just a couple years removed from the World Series. The Sixers were bad, but it was Iverson and then Stackhouse. And they're talking about this junior at Lower Marion High School, <laughs> Kobe Bryant, his dad, Joe, Jelly Bean. And Kobe knew it. He would enter, like I, I said, when he passed on that Sunday, the day before Super Bowl week, and people asked, he was the same guy, you know, his final day of confidence and cockiness and self-assuredness as he was when he was a sophomore in high school. <laughs> you, you know what's amazing about that real quick is- He believed in himself like nobody's business. You have, you know, everybody That's can so remember awesome. where they were when 9-11 happened, right? Yeah. For sports fans, you can remember exactly where you were when you found out Kobe Bryant. Because it's so shocking. Of course. I thought it wasn't right. real. The moments that yeah. are that shocking to you, for some it's Michael Jackson dying. For some it is right. Challenger explosion. They're tragic events. Normally, they're never anything really good. 
it's always tragic, death, loss, sadness. People remember what they were wearing. Right. They remember where they were, what it smelled. I was in line at Old Navy on that Sunday buying something I needed to go to Miami for the week for Super Bowl Radio Row to check in the hotel. Right. And I opened Instagram and DJ Ire was a picture of Kobe and Vanessa and the girls. And I was like, and then it's, I can't believe you. And my heart just sung like, oh my God. I got out of the sauna and I, and I could hear the TV and I got on the sauna and I saw Kobe Bryant died and I'm like, with his daughter. And I was like, what? Because yeah, it was that shocking. Yeah, it was like this. If MJ passes at 82 wrong. years of age, yeah. you won't remember. Yeah. If it happens tomorrow, you will. Yeah. Well, Josh, keep doing what you're doing. Tina, thank you for coming. Appreciate you. Uh, I hope you guys come back. All of you guys come back. Come on in. We'll have fun. She's your guest next yeah. time. Yeah, you got to break <laughs> her out of it. She's your guest next time. Yeah, man. Thank you, Josh. Keep doing what yeah, you're doing. It. You explain things awesome, man. Really, really. Thank you for having me, guys. Th appreciate thank it. you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, where's the best place to watch, listen to everything? ESPN 106.3 FM, weekdays 4 to 6. Tell any smart speaker, play ESPN West Palm. We stream live on the ESPN app. Same thing. Um, the podcast is on UFC Fight Pass, The Lover and the Fighter. Me and Dean, as you see there on the screen. And um, on Instagram, the former world champion. On Twitter, Josh on it. Nobody cares about it. <laughs> well, okay, you'll see and everybody can get all of this it's worldwide hit me get in the dm the i reply to your dms i know you hate me it's fine I, <laughs> I'm just... to being a kid but as i got older started working out i had to watch out for sugar and empty carbs magic spoon has the amazing flavors you'll love but high protein and less sugar. The variety pack, four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. This pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. Only 140 calories per serving. It's high protein, zero grams of sugar, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free. The fruity one, I'm done for. I can eat the whole box, no problem. Go to magicspoon.com slash MSCS to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use promo code MSCS at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. That says something. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash MSCS and use the code MSCS to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode.